A Thank you, uh, we, because we have colleagues from different parts of the world that are going to join us. We uh, should stay. Can they hear me with this? We can hear you beautifully, Marcelo, and it's such a pleasure to see you. We also see you very well. Your Good. usual Thank elegant you. self. What, Fernando? Yes, Marcelo. Qué gusto, qué gusto, qué gusto de verte. It's Es un placer verte. Lamento no estar ahí en persona, pero es una lástima con... porque hay muchos colegas tucho, tuyos que te quieren mucho y estaban esperando verte. Me habría encantado estar ahí, pero pero será otra vez. La próxima vez. Fernando Reimer, es colega de, de Harvard. Mm. ¿Usted lo conoció con el? el, el ah, porque el, es, es español. No, es. Eh, ¿Eh? I think we, we, have we have corresponded, um, President Zanini. Okay, I, I'd like us to uh, I'd like us to uh, get started. Good afternoon. We now turn to the second session um, on the matter of um, this afternoon uh, here in Rome. Uh, we are uh, addressing issues pertinent to some of the basic conceptual uh, concerns that flow from ethical um, uh, choices in uh, the context of, uh, of the pandemic. And uh, I, I will give the word now to our president, um, uh, Professor Stefano Samagni, who will lead the first uh, paper on the ethical dilemmas of the COVID-19 pandemic. President Stefano. Thank you. Thank you very much. Marcelo, the COVID pan pandemics has triggered an entropy type crisis, entropy type crisis, characterized by the emergence of new ethical dilemmas that deserves, in my opinion, special attention. In the present occasion, I will deal with the only two of these uh, dilemmas. The one concerning the allocation criterion between bearers of equal needs of scarce health resources, and the other one regarding the patentability of life-saving vaccine. Before I go into the substance of this dilemma, I, <clears throat> I deem it appropriate to clarify the question of a general nature, yet pertinent to the case in question. There is no doubt that COVID, the COVID event represents a, a formidable challenge to politics. For the first time since the Second World War, policymakers in various countries have faced three major problems. First, how to design effective interventions to reduce the spread of infection and at the same time minimize uh, the economic cost uh, of these uh, measures. Secondly, how to measure the extent uh, of the trade-off between safeguarding human lives and preserving the productive capacity of the economic system? Finally, which categories and groups of people should carry the burden of the interventions? Clearly, an ideal model should provide the necessary information for the implementation of the measures, considering equity as a criterion. But such a model does not exist yet, which explains the bewilderment of so many 
and the rise of bitter conflicts in the political arena. Just to give you an example, policies aimed at mitigating the consequences of fragilities can counter those aimed at mitigating vulnerability. And this happens for the simple reason that while the first type of measures postulate short-term interventions, the latter, namely mitigating vulnerability, require a long-term time horizon. And that is still a, a something that we are, as I said, lacking at the theoretical level. I now move to the, consider the first ethical dilemma I was uh, talking about. Now, what is the bioethical challenge that arises uh, in, in the cases uh, of healthcare research? Now, consider, for example, the case of triage. If uh, the number of patients to be admitted in, uh, is higher than the number of available beds, doctors are forcing to what Guido Calabresi called a tragic choice. Hence, the temptation to abdicate the principle of equal treatment of all individuals in clear violation of the intangibility of human dignity. To shed some light on the problem, it is worth starting from the two main bioethical paradigms still at the center of lively debates uh, among uh, bioethicists and other people. These are the principalist model and the utilitarian one. The principalist model, as it is called, adopts uh, the following logical scheme. It starts from absolute principle and uh, as such non-negotiable. From this, one obtains some operational criteria to be applied to the myriad of cases of life that reality presents. A recent application of this model was advanced by many scholars in, in the September 2020 issue of Science, of the, the journal, the Review Science. It is called the Fair Priority Model in the allocation of anti-COVID treatments. Priority is defined as fair when the following three criteria are met. Reducing premature death, minimize the negative consequences of economic and social nature. Third, shorten the time to restore the pre-pandemic situation. Now, what is uh, the problem with such a proposal, with the fair priority model? It's poor practical applicability. And the reason is that it is never indicated whether the three suggested criteria are to be taken in lexicographic order or all three simultaneously. In the first case, the decision-making problem would only be moved to another level. Who decides which of the three criteria comes first? And how much must one criterion be satisfied before moving on to the others? In the second case, the proposal put forward would be almost irrelevant, finding application only to simple and unproblematic situations. What about uh, the other ethical paradigm? the utilitarian one, which is uh, still the dominant one at the international level. Unlike a principalism stemming from the deontological ethical metrics, utilitarian ethics consider, considers that it does not make sense to start from abstract, albeit noble principles. In line with the pragmatism of Charles Peirce, this paradigm suggests focusing attention on individual cases, always having as goal the criterion of maximizing the sum total of utilities. Now, can one be satisfied with this paradigm? Of course not. Why? Because to calculate the sum of individual utilities, it is necessary that these are cardinally measurable quantities. 
But as Wilfredo Pareto made clear at the beginning of last century, personal utilities not being comparable with each other can only be measured in an ordinal way, not cardinal. But in this way, we cannot add them up. And therefore, the utilitarian approach becomes useless. And this is a, a real paradox. A remedy to this paradox, so to speak, was advanced in the 80s in the United States with the proposal of the criterion of CALIS. CALIS is an acronym which stands for Quality Adjusted Life Years. It runs as follows. Rationing must be carried out considering the number of years of residual life adjusted for its quality that a certain treatment is likely to ensure. In practice, the adoption of the Cali's criterion implies that it is um, mandatory to set an entry age limit uh, into, for instance, intensive care. And as you know, this was adopted, for instance, in Netherlands during this uh, crisis and in many other, and even in my country, Italy. Now, the UN report on the index of happiness in various countries, presented in April last year in New York, introduces for the first time another criterion, the so-called well-by approach, which combines the two criteria of quality of life and length of life together. In my opinion, it is a significant first step in the right direction. Yet, uh, medical ethics from Hippocrates onwards has always adopted the principle that one human life is worth as much as another, whatever its health condition. It is obvious that one is free to embrace uh, the utilitarian logic, but then has to be declared right from the beginning, and one should uh, in a sense, consider the other consequences which stems from that. An interesting line of research, although still far from being fully articulated, is the one started by the Human Flourishing Program from Harvard University, a program founded in 2016, so a few years ago. Now, the basic idea of the Human Flourishing Program is to reject uh, the logic of trade-offs because it would be immoral to counter the economic consequences resulting from the pandemic to the number of human lives lost. The approaching question escapes uh, this moral trap considering that many other aspects of well-being contribute uh, to the preservation of life. For example, unemployment, social isolation, and depression increase the risk of mortality and uh, morbidity, as we know. So the approach of total lives saved considers not only the number of lives saved or lost because of the pandemic, but also the number of lives saved or lost because of the above mentioned factors. It is uh, certainly true that personal well-being and its components are an important marker to take into due consideration. But likewise is the human flourishing, the eudaimonia in the sense of Aristotle, with its constituents <coughs> such as re relationality, the search for the meaning of life, the formation of character. The total lives saved approach, treating all human lives as having equal value, certainly considers well-being, but it does not do so by assessing its effect on life itself. That, that is why well-being is seen as a function of life and not as an end in itself. By the way, this approach has important, in my opinion, implication when we come to consider the situation of children, as it is. Because uh, according to the other approaches, uh, children, this morning some of 
of the people here said, that why the children during the pandemic were not so considered? That is the reason, because the children are not yet productive factors, so they were put aside. And uh, in the hospitalization, we have a lot of empirical evidence indicated exactly that, etc. Of course, uh, there are methodological knots uh, that need to be resolved before such an approach uh, can be concretely applied. And the most important of this is the one regarding the choice of the metric. In other words, uh, how to assign a way to the various domains of value which are considering. In any case, the starting point, in my opinion, is promising and constitutes a particular application of the ethical virtues of Aristotelian and Thomistic ancestry that represents an alternative to both principalism and uh, utilitarianism. And uh, that is why it is proper to discuss all these issues, because we are still at the beginning of the problem. Let me pass now to the other uh, ethical, the other ethical dilemma, namely the patentability of anti-COVID COVID vaccines. We know that effectiveness of a vaccination campaign postulates its universality. Indeed, vaccinating some social group or some countries only would be of little use. Public opinion generally agrees on the fact that intervention in favor of poor countries is not merely philanthropy, but a strategy of intervention in defense also of the countries of the north of the world. The problem that arises then is not so much the end to be reached, but rather the way, the path to be followed in view of that end. The best solution would be to design a system of licenses controlled and financed by governments and to mobilize the most effective companies to which to entrust the production of vaccines, maintaining their name and brand. Clearly, this is a project that takes a long time to implement, but there is uh, already an important precedent, namely vaccination against a seasonal influenza. For over 50 years, after the great flu epidemic of 57-58, within WHO, the Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System has been operating joined also by numerous public institutions and non-profit research foundations. Experts and scholars from the 110 member, uh, member countries of this network meet twice a year to analyze and discuss the latest data on new flu strains and decide how to change the vaccine of the year. Now, the system is a remarkable example of what Amy Kapinski of Yale, from Yale University, has called open science, whose goal is the protection of human lives and not the achievement of simply profit, extra profit. These systems work uh, well, as you know. So we have already an important example which could be applied to the case under distinction. It will take some time before such a model can be applied to the case of anti-COVID vaccination. But this uh, will happen because what is before our eyes is both unsustainable in terms of uh, economic uh, reasons and immoral in terms of fairness. Two recent measures represent a step in this direction. Last spring, the European Parliament approved the rule introducing the lawfulness of compulsory licenses for vaccines, suspending intellectual property and therefore patents, recalling what was decided in the year 2005 when patents on anti-malarial and anti-IDS drugs were suspended. As is well known, it is only from the 1994 TRIPS, TRIPS is the acronym which stands for 
trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. That uh, there are growing constraints to the implementation of an open science, which has created the space for the increasingly intense use of patents and therefore the birth of intellectual monopolies. Today, we have intellectual monopolies to, which do not attract, in my opinion, enough attention from scholars. What then are the arguments, if that is the same, for maintaining the status quo? The first argument is, uh, is practical, and uh, I, I can easily skip on that. But uh, this practical argument, according to which patents would not would by no means guarantee an adequate production of, of vaccines for the reasons that we know already. But the evidence supporting this argument is <clears throat> very, 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 very little. And, and indeed, uh, it is uh, certainly true, but uh, it's a, a petition of principle. Because if we had started to address this issue in September 2020, when all the elements for taking decisions were already well known, we would not be in the current situation today. Not only that, but uh, if the self-financed COVAX, and Jeff knows a lot about because he was involved in that project and started, but it was boycotted. I, this project was a sabotage giving Yame from Duke University, which uh, Jeff knows very well, was one of the co-founders of the project, recently wrote, I quote, it was a great idea, born of true solidarity. Unfortunately, it has not come about because rich countries have behaved worse than, than any worse nightmare. I, I repeat behaved worse than any worst nightmare, unquote. So that means that people are opening their eyes to the situation. Now, the second argument to maintain the status quo, which has been followed, has to do with the inadequacy of the legal framework as the primary responsible for the lack of vaccine doses. The reference is to the nature of contracts between governments and pharmaceutical companies for the supply of vaccine, uh, vaccines. A circumstance which has greatly surprised, in a negative sense, public opinion. It was not imagined that the system imposed by the pharmaceutical sector and passively accepted by the world of politics would be able, during the last 30 years, to endogenously modify the rules uh, of market operation. The practice, in fact, was that once a product is approved uh, by the proper agency, government and companies agree on the price and the sale of the product. But the negotiations is kept, are kept secret so that citizens cannot know the final price of all components. And, uh, in this way, do not know how much is the extra profit component. And uh, this even though a non-insignificant part of the research funding comes from the public, public funds, that is from the tax revenue paid by citizens who have been denied transparency. The fact is monopolies kill the market economy as any intellectually honest economist knows, at least since Adam Smith. A third argument is perhaps the most delicate. There is a tendency to say that without patents, there would be no longer be an incentive to do research, nor would there be public and private capital willing to take this, to take risk. Now, such an assertion is on the one hand unprovable, and therefore devoid of scientific validity. And on the other, culturally pernicious. In fact, to prove the correctness of the claim, a counterfactual analysis should be prepared to compare the outcome of two scenarios, one without patents and the other with patents. But this is manifestly impossible. 
On the contrary, it is true that empirical evidence suggests that the patent monopoly regime is in no way encourages innovative activity. Think of the famous case of the polio vaccines invented by Albert Sabin and jo Jonas Salk, funded by, with the support of the Roosevelt Foundation and many other individual donors. When uh, you see Salk was approached and um, he was asked to patent his invention, he replied, can we patent the sunlight? That was his uh, reply. On the same line of thought, uh, Although several years earlier, the famous economist, Nobel Prize winner, Friedrich Foynal, von Hayek, one of the founders of liberalism in economics, noted that while the ownership of private goods is a consequence of scarcity, intellectual property generates an artificial shortage. And he concluded that the patent was certainly not the best way to support the creativity of research. So why many people keep on saying that if you, are, uh, if you follow liberalism, you should, which is a lie. And we continue to repeat lies after lies, etc. Just to avoid any misunderstanding, it is worth noting that the elimination of the legal institution of patents as such is not a stake here, but only of those which, like life-saving vaccines, have the nature of common goods. Common goods are neither private goods nor public goods. And not only that, but the discovery of vaccine is the result of a collaboration between both industry scientists and scientists active in university and in many research centers. In addition, we cannot ignore the non-repairability contribution of government. But then, if this is the case, why is it that the extra profit, extra pro, not normal profit, why the extra profits are paid only to the shareholders and not also according to some rule of proportionality to all those who have contributed to obtain the results? That is a question to which nobody has been able to provide an answer, etc. I have finished my time, and so uh, better going to conclude. In any case, in the paper, there are all the references which are necessary for those who want to. And I would like to conclude with a, a general consideration that the possibility is always the combination of two elements, opportunities and hope. It is wrong to think that for something to happen, it is necessary to intervene only on the side of opportunity, that is, on the side of resources and incentives. Indeed, the problems that we face today are not resolved by invoking a mere increase in resources. What is necessary for the possibility to come to be is to insist on the element of hope, which is never utopia. Hope is nourished by the creativity of intelligence and by the purity of civic passion. It is this awareness that opens to hope, which is neither the fatalism of those who rely on luck, nor the misoneistic attitude of those who give up fight. It is hope that spurs action and enterprise, because the one who can hope is also the one who is able to act to overcome the paralyzing apathy of the existent. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you so much, President Tamagni, for your paper. Uh, we now turn to Professor Fernanda Reimers, who is joining us via Zoom from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Fernando. Thank you so much, Marcelo, for the invitation to join you this morning. I'm sorry I cannot be with you in person. I'm going to summarize a paper which is available for any of you who would like to read it, just send me an email. 
uh, because I would very much welcome your feedback and your questions and your comments as we finish these papers for publication. And the paper is titled Between Loss and Hope, Paradoxical Educational Effects of the COVID-19 Pandemic. And at the bottom of that slide is the email address where you can ask me for a copy of the paper if you want to read it. And I'm going to structure my presentation in four sections. I'm going to uh, quickly provide an overview of the educational effects of the pandemic. I'm going to then talk about the silver linings in education. I'm going to comment on the risks, um, and I'm going to talk about the opportunities. So the, on the educational effects, in, uh, on March 11th, when the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic, uh, my colleague Andrea Schleicher, Director of Education at the OECD, and I sent a survey to ministers of education and other senior education leaders asking them what plans they had made to continue to educate during the pandemic and what difficulties they foresaw. And that document, which is perhaps now of historical value more than anything, is very telling um, because essentially education leaders anticipated what came to be. When we, for example, we asked them how critical are the following priorities in response uh, to the crisis? And they are organized from those that receive the most responses to the least at the top to those at the least responses. Most people were concerned with ensuring continuity of academic learning, with providing professional support to teachers so that they could teach remotely, ensuring the well-being of teachers, supporting students who did not have the skills to study independently, ensuring their well-being, and so on. We asked the same respondents. Um, how challenging is it going to be to address those priorities? And at the top, they said, ensuring continuity of academic learning is going to be very challenging. Supporting students who don't have the skills to learn independently. Ensuring that parents can support their students. Ensure, ensuring that we have ways to assess student learning. Redefining curricular priorities during the crisis. We then asked them, uh, have you begun to put in place arrangements and how challenging has it been? And at the top of the challenges was the availability of technological infrastructure, addressing students' emotional health, achieving the right balance between on-screen digital time and screen-free activities. My colleagues in the Global Education Innovation Initiative and I then began a study which we conducted between June of 2020 and uh, March of 2021 examining the, and it's an open access book, you can download it in that, on that link, which I'm happy to provide. And we examine what had happened to the pandemic in the following countries. And we also had a couple of chapters that looked at cross-national evidence, um, in some cases in OECD countries and another in the developing world. And the story of that study is that the influence of COVID on education, of which only the influence via the closure on schools really happened through the following channels. Number one, crowding out of fiscal space because governments had other priorities. And for some of them, it became challenging to devote more resources um, for the strategies of continuity. The austerity of families because the distributional effects of the pandemic were very unequal. And now families found it difficult to support their kids. So the reason some children, uh, some girls were married off and began to work wasn't just because they weren't engaged with schools, it's because the families uh, had less money to support them. There was, of course, a health impact of life loss. There was the interruption of schooling and the inadequate arrangements that have been provided. And there were also multiplier effects of the pandemic and other challenges. This is a recent chart put together by UNESCO and the World Bank that talks about how long the school closures lasted. And what we know is they lasted much longer than anyone anticipated in March 18th, and in many countries, far too long. But the story of that book, the story of that book that examines the educational impact of the pandemic, the main story, is that it's not really a single story, that it's a story that is largely mediated by nationality and by social class, because the responses of governments were very different, as well as institutional capacity, and the protecting factors that children who had parents with more resources uh, made a very big difference in how this pandemic played out. So what are the key mediators? Obviously, policy decisions, both at the national level, but also at subnational levels. 
in contexts where the federal government was missing in action, as was the case of the United States, Brazil, or Mexico, state levels stepped up to meet that capacity. And in most societies, civil society organizations stepped up in partnership with governments, a point that I'll come back to later. The role of pre-existing conditions made a big difference. Countries like Finland, countries like Singapore had both made investments in providing digital connectivity and in developing the capacities of teachers to teach online and of students to learn online. And of course, they were significantly uh, less affected in the pandemic than countries that hadn't made such investments. The role of intersectoral coordination, particularly between education and health policy, made a very big difference. In some places, it was total disarray. Health authorities were saying one thing, education authorities were doing something else. Coordination across levels of government uh, made a very big difference. Leadership, point I'll come back uh, to later. Partnership with uh, civil society and cross-national cooperation. But even though most of the existing research on the pandemic right now is on education is obsessing on the question of learning loss, on average learning loss, significantly less attention has been given to what is the main conclusion of this book, which is that educational inequality increased during the pandemic, both within nations and across nations. And least developed countries experienced the brunt of six forces that were mutually reinforcing the longest school closures, the lowest levels of resources and institutional capacity to mitigate learning loss, the lower levels of access to vaccines, the greatest increases in poverty, the lower effectiveness of alternative modalities to education, and the greatest levels of pre-existing social and educational inequality. And so, for example, most countries put in place alternative modalities to educate during the critical period of the pandemic that consisted of both online resources, TV education, radio education, learning packages. But one of the challenges of those multimodal strategies is that they became a stratified system where the children of the poor having access to the least interactive forms of delivery, one way form of delivery. So the pandemic was a, a quintessential, had a quintessential Matthew effect, the term used by Robert Merton based on the um, on this story on, on, on Matthew 25 that basically says the rich will get richer and the poor will lose whatever they had. And this is the story of educational opportunity during the pandemic. But it's very important to balance that story of what was lost, which I have titled in this book, The Educational Calamity of the Pandemic, with the story of the silver linings. What was gained? Because the pandemic presented the once in a lifetime opportunity when the normal rules of operation of the education systems were upended. And in that context, it was possible for people to work in new ways and to produce new things. And a lot of good things happened. So early on, after we had produced that, what well, was the first cross-national study of the impact of the pandemic, which we did with the OECD, we realized that just talking about those findings uh, actually had a very deleterious effect because it was diminishing hope. It was amplifying what everybody knew, that uh, the poor were going to suffer greatly. And so we began to document efforts by national, subnational, civil society organizations, efforts to continue to educate even in those challenging circumstances. And we produced 45 case studies conducted rapidly, which we have recently integrated into this book. And the story of this book is really quite hopeful. It's really quite hopeful because it talks about organizations that in a very difficult time with very little resources did admirable things. For example, the Fundacion Sumate in Chile an organization run by the Hogar de Cristo of the Society of Jesus that works with children who have been abused by their families and as a result of that left their homes. Most of them are street children. And this organization knew that when the government ordered the period of confinement, if they lost touch with the kids, these children would lose touch with the only adults that they trusted. And they created in record time a program delivered in WhatsApp to both continue the education, it's an accelerated learning program to help these kids complete their high school, but it's especially a program of life skills development and emotional development. And that they were able in a matter of weeks to essentially put together a team of psychologists and social workers who were checking in with these kids early in the morning with each and every one of them 
with WhatsApp was really remarkable. Um, similarly, the, or another organization in India that works with very poor children in Mumbai, both teaching them English and life skills, did something very, very similar. Use WhatsApp, which we now know, it is the most accessible technology around the world. Everybody has access to WhatsApp, even if they don't have internet, or most people do. And a number of organizations managed to create and deliver a curriculum uh, through WhatsApp. There were other examples of innovation. For example, the network Teach for All, which is a network uh, of organizations like Teach for America in 70 countries, where the members of that network are communicated and learn from one another. Teach for Nigeria, when the government shut down the schools, engaged their fellows in producing a basic curriculum of English and mathematics uh, on WhatsApp and delivering it on WhatsApp. And when the government of Chile shut down the schools, immediately two 24-year-olds who had read what their peers in Nigeria had done did the same thing. And they produced extremely engaging uh, lessons of math and Spanish, which called the attention of the mayor of this very low income community. And the mayor shared that lesson in a meeting of 200 mayors. And that led to a partnership between 200 municipalities and radio stations and to 50, 20 somethings producing a curriculum that presented a solution which the government had not been able to produce to provide some educational continuity um, in very low income communities. But what is interesting is not just that a group of 50 young people in Chile were able to do that, is that through that network of 70 organizations in 70 countries, that news spread very rapidly. And so the same efforts in Nigeria that had inspired similar efforts in Chile, inspired efforts in Peru and in Colombia and in Mexico. So there is a lot we learn about how it is that good ideas can come from anywhere. And that good leadership is about recognizing those ideas and augmenting them. Something which does not characterize the way in which most public education systems work normally when they're really very much structured in silos and where communication goes within silos and then across silos. In the pandemic, those rules of communication were broken. And it was out of necessity that leaders, the best leaders, actually made themselves very vulnerable and invited input from anyone. The Secretary of Education of Bogota, another one of the case studies contained in this book, the very same day that the national government shut down the schools, called a meeting on Zoom with all school principals. And she said, I need your help. I don't know how we're going to educate during this period, but I think it's unacceptable that we wait until this health crisis is over. Let's figure it out together. The Secretary of Education of the state of Sao Paulo did the same thing. The very same day the national government shut down the school, he reached out to the 10 most influential industrialists in Sao Paulo. And they were able in two weeks to build a multimedia platform that include television, that include podcasts, that include printed packages, and that converted the program of school feeding that is delivered through schools into a cash transfer program delivered through credit cards to families. And this was done in a matter of weeks as a result of partnership between those 10 industrialists as well as the partnership of a public university. So what really surprises about the pandemic is not that during a global crisis of this magnitude, there would be so much interest what really should surprise us is not that there would be a calamity. What should surprise us is that there would be so much interest and effort to sustain educational opportunity. And to me, the real silver lining of, of this pandemic has to be assessed not against the counterfactual of, well, what if we hadn't had a pandemic? Nobody chooses to have a pandemic. And not against the counterfactual of, well, what did we lose relative to the education system before the pandemic? Because the real story is that before the pandemic, the education system was not educating all children, and it was not helping them learn what they need. The World Bank had produced estimates, um, this, which they have characterized as learning poverty, that showed that at least half of the kids, after spending four or five years in school, couldn't basically decode what they were reading. And so to, to hold as a standard the education system before the pandemic reflects a tremendous poverty of aspirations and a tremendous poverty of imagination. What I, think, what I think should surprise us is that in this moment of crisis, the global education movement that was created when, when education was included as a human right in the declaration adopted in 48 came to shine 
involving unprecedented forms of collaboration among UN agencies and non-governmental international organizations, and among them and governments, and among them and subnational governments, and among them and organizations of civil society, such as the examples I provided of the Hogar de Cristo in Chile, or the Fundación, the Foundation in Mumbai, or the Network Teach for All. That is what should surprise us. Now, as we look at those 45 innovations, what do they have in common? They were all created in a spirit of rapid prototyping. The nation of Vietnam, produced in one month, engaging most of their schools in entire primary to secondary school curriculum delivered by television. Think about this for a moment. The design and delivery of an education television station is a project that usually takes three to five years. This was done in one month. A second silver lining is that during the pandemic, we all discovered that no one learns very much when they are in fear. And that if we want students to learn, we need to attend to their social emotional well-being. I think that this is a lesson that is going to remain for us. Um, it is a big learning during the pandemic. Um, we also discovered that it was possible to create multiple ways to reach marginalized children. I'm not saying they were effective. Of course, they were highly ineffective, but think about it. They were created in two weeks. They were created in four weeks. We began to, to put together to construct libraries of digital resources. And we discovered the tremendous power of collaborations, both of teachers within schools, but also of teachers across schools, and in many cases of teachers across countries. And we rediscover the power of inclusive leadership. So more recently, with colleagues in UNESCO, in the International Bureau of Education, we set out to look not at the innovations of the early months of the pandemic, which is what the first study did, the study of the 45 innovations, but of innovations that had demonstrated lasting power that are still around. And what we did was to use the recently released UNESCO report on the futures of education as a framework and to ask, was there any innovation that happened during the pandemic that is already aligned with the ideas of this report? As I imagine, Many of you know UNESCO in its 77 year history has three times put together an independent commission that has produced a report on the futures of education. And this report produced by a commission chair by the current president of Ethiopia basically has three sections. The first section talks about the most serious challenges of our time, climate change, growing social inequality, poverty, democratic backsliding, challenges to human rights and argues that educational systems need to be aligned with the development of the competencies that actually help us address those challenges. The second part of the report talks about what would it take to transform the culture of education. And the third piece of the report says, what are the levers to produce that? So to transform the culture of education, the basic argument of this report is everyone is a change maker. Uh, the report is unapologetically, uh, unapologetically and intentionally aligned with human rights and argues for learning that is authentic and relevant, authentic to problems in the real world, relevant to values that matter to the students. And to transform the culture of education, the report says we need to reimagine pedagogy, curriculum, the organization of school, the teaching profession, and the larger learning ecosystem. And the report proposes four levers for change, innovation and research, universities. It gives universities much greater attention than any of the two previous reports, and it argues that universities have the possibility and the responsibility to partner with education systems to help transform the culture of education, argues for broad and, and participatory social dialogue, democratic dialogue, and for a reimagined cooperation. Well, the interesting thing in the second study of these 31 innovations is that during the pandemic, there were innovative programs that were created that are completely aligned with these ideas and essentially uh, are innovations that support student charter learning much more personalization than is typically the case in normal schools. Not so many that support deeper learning that should concern us. The arrangements that were created to teach in the pandemic um, were focused on lower levels of cognitive development as opposed to more advanced levels of cognitive development. They all address social emotional well-being and what we would call the development of the whole child. There were phenomenal innovations to use digital platforms to build communities of practice and to help teachers um, improve their skills. And there were tons of innovations to find creative ways to engage families in education. Fernando. The third study, yes, Fernando. I need to finish. Two, two minutes. Please. Two minutes. 
So the third study is a study of innovation of universities during the pandemic. We looked at 120 universities around the world and we asked the question, what did universities do during the pandemic? Partnering with cool systems. And the findings of that report are extremely encouraging because we see that in this moment of crisis, many universities didn't just look in the mirror and ask, how are we gonna help our students? They ask, how are we gonna help societies? To conclude, what are the big risks? Well, the big risks, of course, are that we do nothing or even worse, that we content ourselves with returning to the education systems that we had before the pandemic, or that we internalize a, a poor set, an unambitious set of aspirations for what it would mean to build back better. The opportunity is indeed to build back better, building on the innovation dividends and on the ideas that this pandemic brought to the fourth. I apologize that I took a little longer than I intended. I'm sorry, Thank I you. Rush the, I'm happy to send you copies of the paper. Thank you so much, uh, Fernando, for your presentation. You know, Fernando, at the Prado, there is an eternal painting, um, Kronos eats the children. Time eats all of us. <laughs> Time is the great tyrant. So thank you so much for your presentation. And now we turn to uh, our colleagues from Florence, uh, Gunilla Olsen and her uh, colleague. Please, Gunilla. Thank you very much, Excellencies, colleagues and friends. It is truly an honor for UNICEF Office of Research in Nucenti, and me personally, of course, to be here today, together with so many illustrious leaders and thinkers, discussing in-depth issues which concerns us every day. And we have already heard in quite some detail how the COVID pandemic turned into a child rights crisis and reversed achievements towards many of the sustainable development goals, how its impact and responses left millions of children falling deeper into poverty, out of school, and unwillingly uprooted and on the move. So bridging the inequality chasm, so every child everywhere has equal opportunity, remains a distant dream. UNICEF and partners continue to chase that dream in pursuit of the fulfillment of all children's rights. UNICEF Office of Research in Nocenti in Florence seeks to provide answers to the impact on children of two years of life in lockdown with school closures and digital learning worldwide. Through evidence generation, we give a voice to children and adolescents who want to be actively involved in a post-pandemic recovery. In the wake of the pandemic, we established new streams of research to analyze the impact of the pandemic in many areas, education, child poverty, social policies, mental health, intersectional violence and child protection, online and offline. Never before has it been so obvious that the need for more evidence and for new approaches in conducting research and maximizing evidence use for decision and policy making is critical to respond to this as well as to future pandemics and crises. A core research area in our office concerns children's use of digital technology. With the increased access and use of technology by children in most, although not yet all, parts of the world, we recognize that their futures will be influenced and shaped by technology in many ways. And over the past seven years, we've been designing, leading, and supporting global evidence generation on this topic. And we do so by speaking with children and their families about their experiences in the digital environment. We place children's voices and experiences first and channel those voices into policy and program development to help guide the actions of our organization and partners in government and civil society. So Innocenti has developed and leads two of the most comprehensive multinational evidence generation projects in the world in this area. And the first is our Global Kids Online project, which surveys children in the Global South on the risks and opportunities they face online. This is often a valuable starting point for countries that previously have had no evidence to work with. The methodology has been widely adapted and used in more than 40 countries to date by UNICEF, 
and by many of our partners. Our Disrupting Harm project focuses on sexual exploitation and abuse of children through digital technologies, which is one of the most significant harms that children can encounter in the digital realm. Together with our partner organizations in ECPAT and Interpol, Disrupting Harm provides extensive evidence on children's experiences of online sexual exploitation and abuse in a country, and a rigorous assessment of how the national protection system, its legislation and law enforcement is responding to this crime. It's a unique project that has so far implemented, been implemented in 13 countries in Africa and Asia, and we plan to continue implementing it in Latin America, Middle East, and the Balkans this year. And it is our hope that eventually this project can also be funded for European countries where quality evidence on the extent of online child sexual exploitation and abuse is still lacking. Today you will hear from one of UNICEF's experts who founded and led this project and who's continuously contributing to evidence generation on this topic. He'll be speaking to you about how our office responded to the COVID pandemic by doing what we do best, which is to collect data with children and families to understand what they experienced during the pandemic with respect to their use of digital technology and online harms. So I thank you for your time and I ask that the floor be given to my colleague Daniel Cardefeld winter who's online. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gunilla, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Can I just confirm that you can hear me okay? Yes, you can. Fantastic. So it's a pleasure to speak with all of you today. It was great to hear the session earlier today already touch on some of the issues that I will be speaking about. Adult opinions regarding children's use of digital technologies and the internet have for a long time been quite pessimistic. When personal computers, the internet, and gaming consoles were arriving in the homes of families, children were, of course, quick to adopt them, as children often are. But adults worried a great deal about this. They worry that children were no longer going outside to play. They worry that they would lose all of their friends in the physical world, or that they were becoming addicted to technology. And this idea that new technology is harmful, especially to children, is not new. If we look back through the history of technological development, we'll find that with almost every new invention that led to considerable change in society, people were convinced that it would be harmful and threaten children's lives and well-being. And there's a great quote from a parenting magazine that exemplifies this quite well. Uh, it reads, and I quote, Here is a device whose voice is everywhere. We may question the quality of its offering for our children. We may approve or deplore its entertainments and enchantments, but we are powerless to shut it out. It comes into our very homes and captures our children before our very eyes. And I'm sure this quote resonates with a lot of people and the sentence is really quite representative for the discourse around children's internet use over the past three decades. Except the quote is not about the internet. It's about the radio, and it's from a parenting magazine published in 1935. Now, in recent decades, concerns about the negative effects of radio on young people have practically disappeared. But concerns about new technologies have most certainly not. As the COVID pandemic hit, many child rights organizations, experts, law enforcement, or others working to protect children, they rang the alarm bells and said, now that children are going to be stuck indoors and spend more of their time online, they will be much more at risk of online harms than before. And by online harms, I'm, ta I'm talking about issues like exposure to violent content, self-harm content, hate speech, cyberbullying, misuse of personal information and data, and perhaps most severe sexual exploitation and abuse. And while I certainly share the sentiment of protecting children, and, and while I see clearly in the research that we do that the digital environment can have a harmful effect on some children, it all felt a bit premature. And as with many times in the past, adults were assuming 
that increased internet use would cause harm to children. But they were assuming it rather than assessing it. And assessing harms associated with technology use is one of the things that we do in our office. And we do it by engaging directly with children and their families. And we continue to expand this form of data collection and evidence generation every year to all parts of the world. And so when the pandemic hit, our first response from Innocenti was to immediately engage in research with families living in lockdown. Working with the European Commission's Joint Research Center and National Academic Institution in Europe, we embarked on an online survey in 11 countries in Europe uh, with more than 6,000 families and children aged between uh, 10 and 18. And we wanted to understand both how the pandemic was impacting the family and their use of technology, but also if children were experiencing more online harms or not. And the results, they were quite revealing. So first, and, and unsurprisingly, I think everyone knows this by now, we found that the time children spent online more than doubled in most of these countries during the lockdown. Most of this change was driven by digital learning activities. Children were basically attending school online. But this increased the total time spent online by a lot. So clearly the lockdown brought with it a lot of consequences for how families and children engaged with technology, which I think most people would have expected. But we also learned that not all children were happy with this. And in fact, qualitative research that we conducted in parallel um, showed that many children were talking about a kind of dig digital fatigue. Uh, they felt that they were spending far too much time in front of screens and they were tired of it. And it was us adults who, frankly, force them to do it. We made them engage in digital learning, of course, with good intentions, but increase their screen time dramatically. Now, it's easy to say that, well, they were so tired of screens. Why didn't they just stop using it after school? Go and do something else. But we have to remember that in lockdown, digital technology was one of the only ways for children to stay in touch with friends, to remain connected to the world outside. Um, removing that would have removed any sense of normalcy that they had left. And I think this might have been even more challenging for younger children who in our study reported being more anxious during the pandemic than older children. Telling them to put technology aside, it's not an easy ask to make. The World Health Organization made a good intervention here. Um, they recognized the, the risk of increased sedentary behavior in lockdown. They recommended families to buy exercise games or to find safe places for children to spend time outdoors, which were good solutions. And also mentioned previously today by Father Zoll. But what about online harms? Did they increase with the increase in internet use as many people expected? I think first it's important to highlight that many children actually did not experience any of the harms that we measured while in lockdown. And just to be clear again, these risks were exposure to violent content, or self-harm content, hate speech, cyberbullying, or misuse of personal information and data. We did not focus on sexual exploitation and abuse in this study, though we have done so in other work. But overall, this was good news. And it was roughly in line with what we've seen in other research we've done over the years, that a fairly large proportion of children do not experience online harms regularly. However, the other way to look at it is that a fairly large proportion of children do experience online harms. But did lockdown and increased internet use make a difference? The answer that we found, and I find that this is often the case, and it was also reflected actually just now in Professor Reimer's presentation, is that it kind of depends on who you speak to. So among those children who had experienced online harms during the lockdown, uh, around half said that it happened more frequently than before lockdown. And that's a problem because it means that we have a large group of children who not only were experiencing a global pandemic with all of its potentially negative consequences, they were also experiencing more harm when spending time online, which during the lockdown was a really important space for children. That's not good. And in other research we've done, we find that it is often the children who are already vulnerable who tend to experience online harms to a greater degree. So this might have actually had a cumulative negative effect. However, around 30 to 40% of children said that it happened 
well, they experienced online harms to the same frequency as before. Uh, and around 10 to 20% of children, depending on the country, they said it actually happened less frequently. So taken together, it seems as if some children were worse off during the lockdown, while others did not see much of a difference. And some children were actually better off with respect to experiencing online harms. And as we heard earlier today from, from Kathleen McCartney and her colleague, this seems to largely mirror the experience of children during lockdown overall. Some will have been worse off due to unstable families, lack of friendships, lack of emotional support, complicated living environments, etc. But others might have been better off in some respects because they got to spend more time with their parents, because digital connectivity mitigated the effects of isolation, perhaps because they were bullied in school, but not necessarily online. And this raises a very important point, which is that those of us who work to protect and support children have to remember that children's life circumstances are very different, and that children are very different, and that even major events, disastrous events like a global pandemic will affect children differently. And we need to refrain from the instinct to assume that harm is caused to all children equally and in the same way and let evidence guide our response as far as possible. Because if we're too quick to assume that harm is caused, then we fail to recognize the diversity in children's experiences. And that might mean that we fail to construct an adequate response that serves the needs of all children and that meets them where they are in life. And as adults, that really is one of our main responsibilities. It was good to see that many of our colleagues and partners raised concerns around children's online safety when the pandemic hit. Children were and are continuously being harmed in digital spaces and through the use of digital technology. But it would have been even better if the first reaction was to speak to children about their experiences and to assess through research if and how children were experiencing online harms rather than assume it would be the case for all children. And in our work to keep children safe online and offline, UNICEF will continue to push for an evidence-informed response that puts children's voices and experiences first. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. Thank you so much for your kind presentation. Uh, and now we turn to, uh, and now we turn to uh, Professor Ernesto Caffo, president of uh, SOS Telefono Azurro, the mental health of children and adolescents before and during the pandemic. Professor Caffo. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here with uh, all of you and uh, to face this uh, complicated issue about uh, mental health uh, uh, in children and adolescents in this phase of pandemic. Mental health is a complex aspect of, of overall well-being of individuals. We can have uh, health without mental health we say in WHO statement. It is the product of a variety of factors, both psychological and social, and its evolution affects both personal and interpersonal space. Furthermore, by acquiring information leaving positive or negative events in the part of life means that each individual is birth carries with him a set of notions that shapes from moment to moment, the mind, and as a consequence, it influences our mental health. This is greatly amplified in the phase of life transition, such childhood and adolescence. We studied as a psychologist, psychiatrist, this area for many years, but we had so many information now that we have to change our approach to see how we can face uh, the different problems of mental 
adolescence today more and more precocious is in fact by definition a period which is marked by a search of one's own identity, in which the search of the approval of peers plays a fundamental role. In this period of transition, young people try to create interpersonal and social relationships. And uh, to occupy a role within society, which will in part define their future. During this period, concern and dissatisfaction with their own body image also emerge, while trying to conform to the standards of beauty of the society in which they live. This can cause them a certain discomfort. But when they fail in this attempt, and when they engage in risky behavior to achieve it. This is particularly relevant in the new generation, the digital natives, considering that in addition to the physical space in which they move, there are additional digital ecosystems to which they belong. Within this environment, canons of acceptance and reference to be respected in order to fully belong to the different communities. All these aspects, which on, of, on, on the hand, on one hand, allow them to experience social and personal enrichment, often erode their sense of self-worth. This continuous performing, while trying to show the best part of themselves, risk undermining the self-esteem and psychological well-being of young people, especially when, despite the effort to appear perfect, there's not approval of peers, uh, measurable by the numbers of like saying. This reaction of lack or lack of recognition can also result in acts far more serious as, such as cyberbullying, a speech, and non consensual publication of intimate material, texting, grooming, and other. These acts have a huge impact of the mental health of young people, considering that their dignity and social standing both online and offline, is completely undermined. Furthermore, knowing that children and adolescents often hide this feeling of shame and lack of self-esteem, or if expressed, or often misinterpreted and misunderstood, to the remaining often held inside without a solution. The deteriorating mental well-being of children and adolescents around the world preceded the COVID-19 pandemic. There are several studies that show the alarming data of mental health of children and adolescents around the world. And despite several appeals on this issue from national and international organizations, there still persists a lack of implementation of action and policy to safeguard the mental health of young people. Already in 2019, it was found that about 20% of adolescents worldwide experience mental disorder, considering also that half of young people have symptoms of mental disorder before the age of 14. In addition, three out of four adults' mental health problems begin during childhood and adolescence. This data about UNICEF 2021. Among the leading cause of health disorder in youth or behavior disorder, excessive alcohol use and, and drug use, and mental health disorder. A persisting finding over the year is that of suicide and anger as the fourth leading cause of death among youth aged 15 to 19. In addition, a CDC study in the United States shows that more than one in three high school students say they had experienced persistent feeling of sadness or discouragement in, in 2019, such that they were unable to participate to their regular activities, a 40% percent, a percent increase since 2009. Such sentiments are also fueled by the increasing use of social media and platforms. Since before the pandemic, online community have often acted as trigger if encouraging harmful behaviors. Mental disorder are also associated with exposure to online risk, such as cyberbullying, exposure to age-inappropriate content, 
and hate speech. It is often the algorithm of some social media that make potentially harmful content more accessible, such, such as pro-suicide, pro-anorexia, and pro-bulimia side. However, it must be emphasized that uh, it's not the time spent online that causes mental health problems, but uh, it's the excessive use of such system, which significantly interfere with daily activities such as sleeping, eating, and socializing with family or friends. It's not the time, but it's the quality of the time that the children and adolescents use the, the platform. A vulnerable category, both in the offline and online environment, is the group of young people already suffering from mental disorder or more. Children and adolescents with a prior history, uh, with, with, uh, a prior history, history of mental health disorder often suffer from the stigma uh, associated with the mental suffering, isolation, and discrimination, and are more vulnerable to further risk and violence, both in the physical and virtual world. The combination of social and economic factors, such as household structure, educational background, pre-existing mental health condition, for example, children with special needs, being economically disadvantaged, or personal and family experience with one of more disease, and the pandemic significantly amplified its effect on the individuals regardless of their age group. Undeniably, the containment measure adopted by governments around the world to counter the spread of COVID-19 have radically disrupted everyone's daily life, with implication in the economic, social, and psychological sphere is activating pre-existing problems. This is true not only for adults, but also for children. In fact, children seem to be mostly spared from the virus, or if they are affected, in most cases, the symptoms they present are mild. The issue is totally different if we consider psychological well-being. The health emergency has changed, changed, changed the context of life, uh, of life of children and young people leading to the closure of school. From the end of February in Italy 2020 until the end of the school of the, of the last year and two in the, this year, and the introduction of distant learning, confinement to their homes, the impossibility of having contact with the presence of their peers, and the suspension of the all extracurricular, extracurricular activities. This restrictive measure have created abnormal as well as unexpected developmental condition for adolescents. The social rules that all of them were asked to follow are completely at odds with a natural urge in this phase of the life cycle in which the person is strongly involved in exploring the external world in the search for autonomy and new experiences in the construction of meaningful relationship outside their family of origin, in the attributing importance to value, such as will, willingness to change, in the exploration of projects for the future, and not least in the construction of the renewal awareness of their bodily identity. Confinement within one own home, in effect, to consider in several respects. While, while many studies show that home confinement has provided space for the strengthening of interfamilial relationships, confinement at the same time could exacerbate previous events of violence perpetrators, perpetrated by the circle of trust. Direct exposure to one's perpetrators has increased in case of unreported domestic violence has been quite a concern, both from women and children. This case in particular has protracted mental health consequences for children and adolescents. Adolescents in particular have really, really been in the focus of specific attention and intervention during this particular period of time. This is undeniable that the consequences of restriction include increased level of anxiety and depression, altered sleep, wake, rhythms, a feeling of loneliness, irritability, boredom, but also symptoms referable to post-traumatic disorder. 
One study compared 250 samples of children and adolescents from 18 to 18 years old before COVID-19 and during lockdown and found that participants exhibited more severely anxiety and severe sleep-related disorder during lockdown than before COVID-19. The data obtained from a listening and counseling center framed the ongoing mental health condition of the new generation. According to Child Bella International, in 2020, there were a total of 50,176,000 calls made to helplines. Of those 50 million calls, 30%, 30 percent, 30.6 percent of contacts were due to mental health issues, including fear and isolation, suicidal talks, and behavioral issues. In addition, 12.8 percent of calls instead requested support in accessing services ranging from essential goods to legal support. Approaching to the European landscape, one in three children contacted a blind for mental health related reason. Researchers and mental health professionals expressed particular concern for children with previous mental illness whose lives many have been severely impacted by restrictive measures. The UK charity Young Minds in 2020 surveyed adolescents with psychiatric disorder and 83 of them reported their mental health deteriorated. Moreover, in a fourth study conducted in Turkey in 2020, children and adolescents aged from 6 to 18 years, which a previous diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder, reported an increased frequency of contamination, obsession, and cleaning, washing, washing compulsion during the pandemic period. In spite of the questions raised by the scientific reading concerning the side effect of COVID-19 pandemic from a psychological point of view for young people, the study conducted are quite numerous even in those that specifically focus on adolescents or very few number. I, I have to say that the research in this area is uh, very immature. We have a very few paper at, uh, with the methodology of research is still very weak. Moreover, to date, it appears difficult to draw univocal conclusive indication from the literature in general on the psychological effect of the pandemic, since the time span is marked by alternate phase of opening and closure. Therefore, the result necessarily refer to specific phase considering and longitudinal study or really scarce. Beyond this limitation, the picture that emerged is anything but encouraging. While well, adolescents are sure to be more responsible as the personal motivation led them to follow the rule of social distancing in the first lockdown out of a desire to protect others and resilient, and the pandemic condition led them to discuss more with family and friends about mental health. In general, the study show a situation of generalized malaise. It can be concluded by setting out the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated an already existing condition of distress and malfunction of personal mental health of children and adolescents, which had been progressing for a decade, also by a persistent lack of attention and specific intervention by a designated institution and school. How can the mental health of children and adolescents be improved? The overall study conducted until now lead to several actions to carry out in the near future. It is essential to provide some indication that can guide intervention aimed at uh, strengthening strengthen resources, reducing the negative effects of the pandemic and taking care of today adolescents. In fact, the damage caused by the pandemic can be mitigated if targeting and timely intervention are put in place. In place. Starting from the situation of discomfort and suffering of children and their own observation, it is necessary to create support networks that cross the various ecosystems to which children and adolescents belong. What is needed is the implementation of a map of connection and service with schools to service that can identify themselves as point of reference while welcoming and listening to discomfort. It is essential to strengthen those services that make the school 
a context of taking care of the adolescent at 3600 uh, degree, starting from the essential collaboration between parental and educational figure, including moments of confrontation, passing to service useful for the orientation of young people in the later stage of the study or work, arriving up to listening and reception service, such as school psychology service, for which much uh, had been done in recent years, but much remains to be done so that they are accessible to in all schools. Among the more institutional actions, there is the need to develop child mental health policy, implement the prevention and early intervention strategy from transition age, youth, and reduce disparity in providing mental health care. Strengthening the network service with the involvement of all professional and institution of reference and investing in periodic training and developmental of skill of health and social workers, including on mental health issue, will provide comprehensive service integrated and able to respond and take charge of the territorial level. In order to implement the above mentioned, mentioned measure efficiently, it is essential to intercept these children and their needs at the early stage, in the defined new model of care that take into account their language and their needs. Young people, young people must participate in the decision making and policy making process since they are the recipient of this future proposal. A great opportunity is also provided by the digital channels in terms of wellness promotion, prevention and diagnosis and evaluation caretaking, but also for research. In particular, the closure of service during the pandemic led to a suspension of traditional care and caretaking pathways. This brought out strongly the need of implement new intervention through digital technologies. Digital psychiatry and telemedicine are promising methods when working with young people precisely because they are accustomed to using digital devices on a daily basis. Some children and adolescents even seem to prefer telemedicine to the traditional therapy because they see it as a more of a game. Talking through the screen also makes them feel less judged. It is uh, also important to consider how to help kids to the platform they use most. Among the most innovative ideas is the construction within the new digital ecosystem, the metaverse, of listening and support center in order to make every environment, both physical and virtual, a place that protects children and adolescents and their experience. In conclusion, to implement a better approach to improving the well-being of children and adolescents, it's also necessary to think about near future, a near future where COVID-19 will no longer be considered an emergency. From this experience, we have uh, learned how crucial it is to listen to the needs of children themselves, to understand, including through their needs, what action needs to be taken to safeguard their mental health. Children and adolescents must be protagonists in this decision that will affect their lives actively participating in the decision-making process. Self participation must be a constant feature of all measures and policies that affect the well-being of children and adolescents. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Caffo, for your intervention. We now have approximately 30 minutes for discussing all of the papers. So that is to remind us the paper by Professor Amagni, the paper by Professor Reimers, uh, by our, our colleagues uh, from UNICEF, and Professor uh, Kafos' presentation. So I leave it uh, open now for questions and, and, and comments and suggestions. So I have a question. More of a question, I'll present a um, uh, an issue. So for about <clears throat> for a decade, I was a dean in the western, in the west coast of the United States. 
And um, I came to know firsthand some of the architects of these new um, social media platforms and technologies. And here is the paradox. They would not let their children have um, iPhones, iPad, laptop. And um, this was uh, given to me uh, because of the responsibilities I had uh, running a set of a network of, of, uh, of, of schools, including research schools and experimental schools. Um, and one of the themes that surfaced was the following. Again, these are the architects of these platforms. They were purposefully devised for their addictive quality, property. Uh, Giddens, I think in the fifth lectures, argues that the malaise of um, the movement from pre-modernity to modernity <laughs> ushers the emergence of the obsessive compulsive disorders as the malaise of our time, as we move away from the ritual ordering of human cultures. So I wonder, if, if Professor Kaffo, if you would comment on this. So evidently, these instruments are devised purposefully to addict young minds. That will be the vehicle that will solve the problems we face today? It's a question. <laughs> Thank you for the very interesting question. <clears throat> I think that uh, we have now a, a very uh, interesting situation and uh, we had a few days ago a Sefer Inter Day meeting, and we discussed about, uh, in this case was a meeting in Bocconi, where we speak between um, economist, uh, uh, engineer, uh, sociologist, uh, and psychiatrist, uh, what will be the future of the digital world for children. Uh, in this case, we have to say that the company uh, work uh, now in the area of data. The data of children are crucial. What happens is that uh, technology now is able to understand very well what we have uh, in our personal experience, all the data of when we are born or in the hand or to before uh, of the big company, and they can decide uh, through the algorithm what can be uh, our behavior. And all the data can be uh, utilized to, to control the future of our children in some way. And uh, I think uh, this is a big issue, the fact that uh, sometimes uh, the dependency of many children to the technological instrument depends on the system that they use. When, in particular, one area that we, uh, we have uh, now uh, in the experience of the children is the gaming area. In the gaming area, you are dependent on the game that you're utilizing. And the gaming company uh, know very well the data of the behavior of the person, in particular children and adolescents. And their products work very well if they are able to maintain the child in the system. To use the data is, uh, for them, a crucial area to, re uh, to collect uh, resources, economical resources because the system uh, of the data, of the big data is a system which more data you have, more 
money you can have. This is a way which we have to, to discuss how we have to work with the company to, to discuss this issue. Because to the children means that we have to see how can be the best solution in the interest of the, of the children. I think that now we don't have any control of the system. Only Europe try in the last years uh, with the GDPR, with other systems to have uh, more control. For example, one issue is the age verification topic. The fact that the children can enter in any place uh, without any control. And as you know, we have uh, many uh, risky uh, places where the children can go. For example, the pornographic site, where they can enter and they can use all the material that is there. And uh, without any rules in this area of uh, child uh, age verification, it's impossible to block this kind of situation. I think now we have to see how we can work more with company, with institution to face this problem. This is a big issue, I think. And uh, the op issue of algorithms that uh, control our behavior is a, a crucial issue. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Cafo. Um, Professor Samani, also I want to remind you that we have colleagues on uh, line, on the Zoom, that they can ask questions. So, well, so, uh, Professor Samani, then Carola. Uh, thank you. Not being a, a member of this invisible college, because I'm an economist, I would be happy to hear the reaction in particular of Fernando and Gunilla, but also to the others, uh, to the following question. I never heard so far the use of the word connection. What do you think about that? Connection, it's, uh, by the way, a word which was coined by Aristotle, 2,400 years ago. And in recent times, it has uh, attracting a lot of attention. Do you believe? that is just a, a mode, a fashion, something like that, or there is a substance in it. And connected to that, what do you think about the future of the flipped class initiative or experiments? Do you think, again, they started, if I, I'm, I'm correct, in the States, in the, well, I don't remember the state, but uh, it is spreading. Do you think that this represents a, a real alternative from a pedagogical point of view to the usual way of carrying on classes? And finally, in a few years ago, Edgar Morin, uh, he gave a, a lecture or a seminar after publication of a small book, uh, the title of which is Pollicina. That is the Italian title. And in that book, eh, which was initially published in French, Ad Morin says that there is no way that the adult generation, our generation, can understand the children. In other words, can give, provide an answer to the question, what is the future of our children in a digitalized society? Why? Because our frame of mind or mind of the adult people is totally qualitatively different. In other words, for an adult, these new technology are a means, are an instrument for enhancing our abilities. But for the children, they are not an instrument. They are part of their world. They are, and so the way that we approach the problem is totally different from that of children. Do you think that uh, this, uh, this is uh, an argument which deserves attention or not? Because as I said, I am not an expert in the area. But uh, my personal experience having grandchildren, staying with children, I have to realize that they do not read. Their cognitive maps are different from our maps. Because when they are born in the last few years, they are born already in an algorithmic type of environment, which is not the case to us. Thank you. Professor Zamani, could I, um, um, could I address the question of the, of the flipped classroom and what we learn about that during the pandemic? 
Yes, please. Uh, yeah, so I, 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 I do think that um, in the studies that we conducted of in innovation generated during the pandemic, we learned two things. One, technology does have tremendous potential to allow greater ways of personalization than traditional instruction. And the flipped classroom is one of those examples. Just by the sheer act of recording a lecture and allowing students the possibility of viewing that at a time of their own choosing and at a speed of their own choosing, that alone is a tremendous benefit over a teacher or a professor delivering an explanation at a time of their own choosing and at a speed of their own choosing. But in addition to that, the possibility of creating very rich banks of digital resources allows personalization in a different way, expanding, enriching the curriculum, which is typically available to students. I mean, that's the great discovery of Khan Academy, that you can produce high level, quali high quality materials and make them available to any child in the world. And in that way, provide that student the opportunity to bypass whatever shortcomings their own teachers have in expertise in an area or not. Having said that, we also learn that there are benefits of the in-person experience from the point of view of social interaction, from the point of view of attending to the social emotional well-being that we don't know yet how to substitute with online environment. I also think that it should be recognized that the innovations that were generated during the pandemic of, in using these technologies were generated in a hurry. They were really improvisational acts rather than the result of planful design and, and engineering. And finally, I think the pandemic showed us not only the potential of these technologies, but also their shortcomings. You may remember that before the pandemic, there were some things that were being said about how technology could replace education that is one with hindsight sound really irresponsible. There's a very famous talk that basically says, provide a computer to children in the streets in Mumbai and they will teach themselves what they know. We now know that the many different circumstances under which children live mean that a child doesn't benefit from technology alone, but with support from others. And some children can get that support at home and others cannot. And so that continues to make a case for the importance of the school. So what I conclude from these two years of experimentation is number one, absolutely, we should be capitalizing on everything that we learn about the potential of these technologies. Second, we should be making much greater investment in developing the capacity of teachers and students to use these technologies properly. And number three, we should be more humble uh, in recognizing that there may be things that the in-person experience can accomplish in terms of socializing the young that we don't yet know uh, whether they can be replaced by other means or whether they should be replaced by other means. But the short answer to your question, the flipped classroom is a phenomenal thing. I've begun to use it in my own teaching at Harvard as a result of what I had to do during the pandemic. Thank you so much, Fernando. Um, just one comment. I think about 15 or 20 years ago, uh, we, um, no names, the head of the, the former head of the media lab at MIT uh, came to this very room and he had a device called the one lap per child. And he articulated, Fernando, essentially the claim that you can leave the laptop in um, Eritrea, in Ethiopia, and the children would teach themselves. And we know how that uh, went. Thank you. We have now um, Carola, and then we have Daniel. Daniel uh, and Zoom. Are you are you with us, Daniel? Yes, I am. Daniel, please. Your your turn. Thank you so much. 
And I, I wanted to respond to the very interesting question you posed around what people refer to as addictive properties of technology. Uh, th this also happens to be the topic I wrote my PhD thesis about, so I'm very interested. I think designers aim to develop technology that children want to use. So a good product is one that is engaging, fascinating, captivating. And those are characteristics that can be seen as contributing to excessive use or addictive use, repeated use. And it also facilitates the form of data collection that Professor Kaffa was referring to, which is very good for companies. Um, and these characteristics that lead children to, to engage perhaps excessively, they're also useful for learning. Uh, it facilitates engaging experiences, relaxation, fun. So it's difficult to ask companies to create, in a way, less addictive experiences, because that means they would have to design more boring experiences that no one would use. So this is a real dilemma. And I think the solution to this is actually in what Professor Kaffo said, uh, that we need to work more with companies. Uh, and my team right now at UNICEF Innocenti, we're working with a Lego group, the, the brick toy company, and we're engaging in research to basically develop a model for how companies can design digital experiences for children that are more conducive to their well-being, to their learning and their development. And the project really centers on identifying design principles that contribute to positive well-being outcomes and working out how to infuse those into different experiences that uh, children engage in online. Uh, and we're engaging in observational and experimental research with children to identify those. And that's a way for us then to influence how companies actually design these experiences that are hopefully more supportive of children's positive development uh, in a way that doesn't affect their bottom line negatively. And one of the things that, um, that we keep coming up against is this idea that um, the design should not be exploitative. It should not contain features that subconsciously lead children to use technology more than they want to or a design that makes it more difficult for children to disconnect or even feel that they want to disconnect. Uh, and I think the endlessly scrolling social media feed is an example of that kind of design. Uh, but other than that, and just to conclude, I also think it depends a bit on us as adults to teach children how to engage with technology in a responsible way. And I think many adults actually are not so good at that. We also uh, overuse technology and we have to help children understand um, when disconnecting would actually be good for them, when it would be beneficial for their health, well-being, or, or other interests. And I think that's a conversation that we as a society and us as adults need to engage in much more closely, but I don't think we quite know how to do that yet. And I think we don't know that how to do, how to do that for ourselves um, either. So very interesting question. Thank you for, for giving me the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel Carola, and then Pada Zollner. Thank you so much. This question is for Fernando. Fernando, I was intrigued by uh, the silver lining uh, issue that you brought up, and in particular, the book on how learning continued during the COVID pandemic on the, on the 45 case studies. And as a qualitative researcher, I was trying to think of the categories of common denominators uh, that might have occurred across the different case studies and, and whether or not there were common denominators. And, and as I was listening to you, I, I wrote down some of the things you mentioned, like attention to social emotional learning, uh, the power of collaboration, um, multiple, multiple modalities. Uh, and as I was listening to Danie Danielle just now, I was thinking about design principles like uh, engagement and, and you know fostering curiosity that sort of thing so I was wondering if you could please speak to what you noticed and if not that would be a great coding uh, task to give to your students thank you thank you so much Carola you are the best because I can see that you read the paper and you have it in front of you so thank you and I only sent it to you yesterday my fault um, yes I I do think that there were a number of common denominators across the 45 cases. In fact, we drew um, 11 lessons based on the common denominators, some of which surprised us and others did not. So the ones that didn't surprise us is that they all, um, 
all of these cases made front and center a priority of attending to the social emotional well-being of children and i think that was that was the pandemic that was the the reality of the situation um, called us to do that another common denominator perhaps an artifact of how we selected the case studies is all of these organizations had a very clear focus in making sure they reach the most vulnerable kids, which is very different from national case studies that look at how governments do that. In our study of the, of the 13 different countries, only Portugal made attending to the most marginalized things a front and center objective of policy. So that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting study in contrast. The things that we were not expecting to find, but that was a common denominator in these case studies. One is the power of new forms of collaboration to generate these innovations that engage, as I mentioned in the example of Teach for All, people close to the kids. See, these were innova innovations that in a way illustrated a form of new power. As if you, if you think about old power, as the power of governments to produce change from the top and engineering from the top. This was just the opposite. These were people close in the front lines who knew much better what was happening than their governments and who invented solutions um, as a result of connecting with their peers, connecting with families, connecting with civil societies, and connecting across schools. So there is a story here about the power of technology not to support instruction, but to support novel forms of organization of people in the front lines that enable them to do things that the old power, that the governments were unable to do at the same speed. And I think that there is a common theme, not in the 45 case studies, but, but in many of them, of new forms of leadership. That was not something we were expecting to find, but as we wrote these case studies, I began to realize that there was a big story here of how people were leading. And so if I could stylize the facts, because I was during this period in touch with a number of education authorities in this country and elsewhere, uh, trying to be helpful, I could see the responses of some of my colleagues in my state, if I could say that, who when I reached them and said, how can we help you? Some of them adopt a, a posture, or a stance of, don't worry, we have it figured it out. And that stance went on for a long time. In retrospect, it is clear that it was a defensive mechanism in the face of a situation where, of course, nobody had anything figured out. This was a crisis for which we had no playbook. But some people in positional leadership thought that the best way they could lead was to deceive and to not admit they did not admit that they needed help. In contrast, in the case studies that generated these innovations, we see the opposite. We see the secretary of Sao Paulo coming in front of people and saying, I need your help. I don't know what to do, but I am committed to ensuring that we can educate. And we see the secretary of Bogota doing the same thing. And it is that humble leadership, that vulnerable leadership, that inviting leadership, that inclusive leadership, that opens room, that makes space for these networks of people in the front lines who actually say, well, we have an idea. Let's work together. So I, I do think if you, if you think about organizations as evolving through stages, from a traditional bureaucratic 20th century stage of top-down to a more pluralistic conception um, where good ideas can come from anywhere, more collaborative and so on, the pandemic was a moment for some systems or subsystems to experiment a pluralistic form of leading that they hadn't experienced before. And I hope we don't lose the lessons that we could learn from that. And I do think that there are very conservative forces in all of our institutions, including our universities, pulling us back to the bureaucracy of the 20th century. And in a sense, intent in making us forget what we experience at this moment of crisis. Thank you so much, Fernando. Father's honor. Thank you. I just wanted to um, come back to Daniel's presentation and response um, in regard to the design. And uh, I wanted to 
to point out that there is uh, the e-safety um, commissioner of the Australian government, uh, Julie Inman Grant, uh, who is doing an extremely fine job in uh, promoting this design. Uh, they call it um, safety by design, so that by using the gadgets that we use, there is already a threshold for becoming addicted and, and so forth. Um, there is also an interesting point for us that we have uh, we can't count ourselves among the digital natives. Um, in the eSafety Commissioner's office, uh, you have, for example, the inclusion of an online safety youth, youth advisory council. So they ask youth how they use it and how they uh, really make sure that we understand, uh, as those who are parents, grandparents, or technicians, or those who have uh, responsibility also in education, what they perceive as the biggest threat to that. So just to, to underline that there is lots on the way and um, we, need, we don't need to reinvent the wheel but just to spread the, the, the good work that is already being done. Thank you so much, Father Sonner. Senator Giannini and then Dean Jaff. You've lost your identity. This is uh, the problem of Ericsson and uh, identity. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just a comment uh, to, to build on uh, some of, uh, first of all, thanks for very, very much inspiring um, presentations in the afternoon. Uh, Fernando, I think, um, you know, put the finger where the issue is. First, this pandemic has been a real game changer. We already have a legacy, which is uh, about different keywords we are you know permanently repeated and built on in our daily uh, activities over the last two years solidarity cooperation collaboration which actually has been translated in concrete different way of working i can mention the un system which more than ever in a very unprecedented way. I mean, I joined UNESCO four years ago now, but I, I see, I understand from my colleagues that this kind of cooperation we are having, for instance, with UNICEF, the World Bank, Save the Children, a lot of different partners within the UN and outside the UN, has been a real new entry in the system. It's about agility. It's about uh, being results-oriented. It's about since the beginning of the crisis, assuring learning continuity, where digital learning, whatever we see, we like or don't like, has been one of the main drivers and one of the main tools. So now I think that we already unlock the potential of change and technology within change. So I think that the risk I see, honestly, is that we are now just focusing on the negative side, some challenges. I also will mention some of them in my presentation later. But the responsibility we have is not to lose. As soon as the narrative is changing, and we see already this week, you know, COVID is no more at the core of the common debate for reasons which are very much understandable, of course. But I think this is a legacy we have to keep and really to protect because uh, this has been a game changer, and I think that is something we have to build on. Either we talk of education and really try to, to, to address more effectively than ever and in the past all the challenges that have been discussed this morning, or other public sectors like health sector, or mostly, more, more, more interestingly, I think the intersectoral approach we have to keep, I think the interconnected challenges we are facing are very much part of the solution, unless we go back to the business as usual, as some conservative forces are trying a little bit to, to force or to, to push for. So I, I fully, from my experience, uh, agree with uh, Fernando and the others about the, the hope side and the positive side of this crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Ashish. Thank you. And I'm going to build on 
build on that last comment, and then I have a quick question as well. I'm, I'm reminded, and I think Fernando really got the heart of this as well, I'm reminded of a um, quotation, and I was trying to quickly look it up when it's from, I want to say it's the early 1990s, uh, a Nobel laureate in economics, uh, Robert Sallow, famous line, uh, after the computing revolution had come to American industry and everything was getting digitized, he said, I see technology everywhere except in the productivity statistics. And his point was that American industry was putting in all this technology and no one could find any benefit of it whatsoever. Well, it turned out that I think most of us believe that in the 10 years that followed that statement, there were massive gains in productivity because the history of technology, and this will get to the issues around technology and education, the history of technology is when you put it in first, you tend to digitize the old process. Whatever you did in an analog world, you start doing in a digital world. And it's actually not that useful. It's a marginal gain. But at some point, depending on the industry, whether it takes five years or 10 years, people start changing the way they work. They start changing how they actually use that technology. And that's when the productivity gains come. And it's interesting to me that the two industries that have been slowest to be influenced and shaped by the technology revolution are healthcare and education. And we can speculate on why those two, they are complicated. Um, but I, I think the fundamental benefits of digitizing education will come when we start reimagining what it is to teach with technology as a platform. And for those of us who grew up in a much more analog way, it's hard for us to conceptualize. So that's, that's sort of a comment that says maybe we need a little patience on this. I do have a question that's unrelated to Professor Caffo, so if I may. You had mentioned this issue of working with companies that are collecting this data. And there's a predicament, and I wonder if you or anybody else has any thoughts on this. These companies collect all of this data on how we use our phones, how we engage with Google and Twitter. And in order to work with them, um, it's very difficult to then do the analysis that shows that their product is very harmful because they will probably not be excited about sharing the data the next time. So there's a very difficult problem here around incentives and, and honest research with these companies. Many of my colleagues who've tried to work with Facebook, for instance, have encountered this where they find a real problem and then Facebook says, please don't come back for future data. And that strikes me as a problem that probably needs some sort of a government intervention but I wondered if people had thoughts about that. So one comment, and then I'd love any thoughts and any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Caffo. No, it's, it's, no, it's true that uh, the company, but in the past, uh, they utilized their own data. It was, uh, they committed their research to universities and they take the data. Uh, Instagram story in the States was the symbol of this uh, process. Now, something's changed. They like to support independent research. Uh, they try to combine uh, effort together. For example, Apple is working with Meta. It's complicated, but they try to uh, face the issue of Metaverse together, because the Metaverse is a way in which all the company have to work together. And uh, I think in this case, uh, uh, our field of academic research had to be part of the process. And uh, the problem is the quality of the research that we have to, to, to build, because uh, uh, the change in this area are so fast uh, that we, have, we need very able people to understand the new process that can be, uh, uh, can be uh, happen. Uh, for example, we are working now uh, with uh, two companies in particular, one because uh, we created, uh, starting from uh, an event that we created in this uh, building, uh, we created a Child Dignity Alliance. The Child Dignity Alliance means a collaboration between companies, regions, and academic. 
And we worked, and this was to uh, answer today, we have a meeting in this building with Apple uh, some months ago, because they try to create an area in which the children can stay in a, in a protected way, in some way, but they try to, to see how they can discuss with the people outside. And, um, and in this network, we found a company now more open to share ideas and to give to some of the data that they have about algorithms, for example. Uh, in this case, Europe is more advantage than the state because we create at European level very strong action uh, with the company. And, uh, and we work a lot about around the algorithm issue. Some company accept, the other company as Telegram don't like to share any data. I think this is a big issue, but I think the future collaboration can be crucial. Dr. Farley. I'm not even how, sure how to phrase this question, but perhaps some of you in the room can address it. Um, there, there are ethical and practical concerns about negotiating with multinational corporations about children's education. Um, we've, many countries have nationalized important country resources and that's an ongoing struggle, as we all know. Things like water and, uh, well, water's the best example because governments don't always take care of us when they take charge of water or forests. So my question is, who should be, in, in your ideal world as educators, public health people, who should be in charge of the internet if not Mark Zuckerberg or the Congress of the United States. Thank you. Jim? Well, I can't answer that question, but I do want to follow up on something she said, because there is another possible explanation about productivity that's not quite as nice, and that is that uh, when you add a great deal of technology, one of the things that can happen is you get a, a huge increase in productivity, but for a smaller and smaller group of highly trained people. The other is being pushed into low-wage service sector, and then when you average them, you don't see anything. But what you've really done is to increase uh, income disparities in a way that you probably don't like. So it's, it's not clear from aggregate data what's really happened to productivity in that sense. I would like to clarify the following. The phrase that you refer to is of Bob Solo. Okay? But we have to be careful because it was uh, stated uh, last century, at the time of the third industrial revolution. Today, we are in the fourth industrial In other words, he was not considering artificial intelligence. And he was referring to automation. But automation is totally different from uh, artificial intelligence. So that is why that statement today is no longer true. Um, you're absolutely right, of course. And I wonder if it is no longer true. I mean, I still think even in this revolution, we still see many places where uh, digitization, where even with artificial intelligence, it takes some time for real productivity gain. It's possible that there's an aggregate disaggregation issue as well. But I still think that even in today's age, so much of the benefit of technology is in reimagining work and reimagining the product and less about the digitization per se. I mean, I think that principle remains, though I agree with you, what Bob Salo was saying was about a different context. Yeah, yeah. It's such a nice line, though, that I love using it. <laughs> you are becoming French, uh, Ashish. What matters is how nice it is uh, conceptually, regardless of how the world works. Thank you so much, and we managed to stay on time. To our uh, colleagues on Zoom, thank you. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for 
staying with us and you're embodying, you're performing uh, the world we're all going to be living in moving, moving forward with your patience and your engagement and staying with us online. So thank you so much. We now have a coffee break and we will reconvene at precisely uh, 17.30. Uh, so please be on time. Recording stopped.
Okay. No, they're not going to go follow us. Don't worry. You'll keep them away. So, uh, welcome back and good afternoon. We now turn to a series of considerations, uh, beginning um, with a uh, synthetic uh, overview of where we are and, more importantly, where do we need to be moving forward. Um, and um, our dear colleague, um, Stefania Giannini, will lead the presentation, Education, a More Resilient, Inclusive, and Human-Centered Recovery. Stefania. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Once again, it's a great honor, great pleasure to be part of this tradition at the Pontifical Academy, gathering expertise, uh, outstanding scholars to share knowledge, experiences, especially now, especially this year, and uh, especially this week, uh, we meet at the time where we are witnessing uh, escalating military attacks in Europe, at the heart of Europe. You know, I belong to a generation who thought that this was not possible, actually. And we see, uh, you know, accounts of human suffering among civilians potentially changing the course of history. So this strikes as we struggle to emerge from another big challenge, the global health crisis that has been already very much discussed uh, in depth this morning and this afternoon. And uh, the interventions uh, we heard since this morning all ring the alarm on the devastating consequences of this pandemic on children and youth. We can say, to put it simply, it's a kind of deep human recession with social, academic, and economic toll. Six months ago, maybe you remember, um, no, sorry, six months into the pandemic, to one year and a half ago, the UN Secretary General had warned of a generational catastrophe. And this is a kind of language uh, which has stayed in our vocabulary all over these months. And coming from the perspective of the UN agency charged with education at all levels, I wish today to share a few further insights into lessons emerging from this pandemic and why, especially why, there are a clarion call for transformation. So, some bad news and some good news, at least from my personal understanding and experience over the last uh, two years. Let's start with some data evidence. Uh, I, you know, we heard already very much this morning, but let me recall that today, two years into the pandemic, exactly this week, schools have reopened in a majority of countries after closures that range from a world average of 20 weeks to more than a full school year in many Latin American countries, for instance, and beyond that, in some cases, let me go to Uganda, where schools were shut for 80 weeks. School reopenings don't equate with the end of the crisis. It would be dangerous to consider that back to school is back to normal or back to better. Over 400 million students in some 40 countries are still learning in hybrid mode, demanding adjustments in teaching or learning. And I think the scars of this experience uh, somehow run deep, as many already mentioned. Let me recall some figures which can tell us the scale. UNESCO estimates that 24 million children may never make it back to school, swelling out of school numbers. Poverty, child labor, early marriage, unintended teenage pregnancy are all factors striking the right to education. It was already before the crisis. A joint report with UNICEF and the World Bank, already mentioned before, the this, this strong permanent interagency cooperation as one of the positive outcomes of this crisis, well, this joint report estimates that 
the number of 10-year-olds in low and middle income countries were unable to read and understand a simple story, very simple test, could reach up to 70% from the already dramatic 53%. That means plus 100 million in addition to the 480 million of learning poverty in, uh, in the world. This same report estimates that the pandemic could cost this generation of students, the COVID-19 generation, and we call them the title of this workshop, close to 70 trillion in lifetime earnings. Well, having said that, we are not paying the price of inaction over the period, but of a pre-existing crisis that has actually collided with the global pandemic, laying bare deep old lines in how education is managed and conducted. I think some presentations, including Jeffrey Sachs' presentation this morning, clearly made the point of that. At standing pace, governments everywhere reacted, reacted uh, promptly, um, overnight, nearly to pivot entire education system to a distance learning, to new online platforms, or a mix of low, high tech solutions from radio, television, and what we call today hybrid model. To put it simply, this innovation and agility has been essential to ensure continuity of learning. I already mentioned before the importance of ensuring continuity of learning. And we have to estimate the cost of not having done that. But it would be somehow disingenuous to say that technology saved the day and holds a golden key to universalize access and bring home better report cards. Later this month, as I already mentioned, we'll be publishing a report, the title provocatively says, An Ed Tech Tragedy with Question Mark. And we actually hesitated to end it on a question mark, but there are some reasons why I will explain briefly. This is not a treatise against that tech, but a warning about the over-reliance on technology for learning and the uncritical acceptance that digital transformation of education is desirable, inevitable, and the pillar of education resilience. Overwhelming evidence goes against the oft-heard mantra that technology will enable education to leapfrog to a better future. If you take it like it is without trying to drive based on ethical principles and a true transformation. First, for nearly 500 million learners, it was a solution that never started or millions more, one that quickly broke down. Half of the world population lack a functional internet connection. This is something we know clearly. Over 700 million people don't have access to electricity. In many low-income countries, less than 10% of children and adolescents are connected against 90 percentage in high-income ones. And the cost of devices even the cheapest available smartphone, is simply prohibitive for poor families. So digital divide is one of the obstacles that we have to address effectively with a very coherent and comprehensive approach. We also saw digital inequalities play out everywhere, including gender digital divide, including in the world's most advantaged countries. Beyond the hardware dimension, let me recall some other important variables uh, further prevented a tech for, from being a, a ready-to-go solution. Teachers' readiness to use technology, only half of middle-income countries offer training on digital skills for teachers. Available space to learn at home, the ability of families uh, to support their children learning, and of course, economic pressure. So this is why school closures come with a kind of cascading effect that supercharge inequalities. And this was far more than deprivation of education. Globally, 
let me mention another, another aspect, another dimension, and uh, uh, some numbers which can enlighten how uh, it's a complex issue to address. Globally, about 370 million children missed out on school meals and essential health services. Our service found that in many low and middle income countries, girls shouldered an even greater burden of domestic responsibilities, while boys' participation in learning was often limited by the need to earn an income. And prolonged isolation, fear loss, and many other factors that you are absolutely already very well developed today have brought issues of mental health to the forefront. So various studies from the US, the UK, and the OECD report increases in depression, anxiety, mental health, emergencies, and suspected suicide attempts. And although global data is limited, evidence shows that cyberbullying has been on the rise, with girls between the age of 11 and 13 increasingly at risk of being targeted by online sexual predators. But this is something that from uh, Professor Caffo's presentation we learned. So in short, the COVID-19 generation, what is about how we can define? I think the COVID-19 generation has been uh, a generation that could see inequalities and poverty increase and could see a lot of uh, different uh, dimensions uh, and challenges that they are facing today growing up with this sense of anxiety and uncertainty. Climate change, digital transformation, uh, an increase in intolerance, uh, and uh, more recently, some other important global geopolitical tension, so to say. But now, let me move to the, to the positive side. What are the implications of of all these and uh, how and what has to be put in march for this generation to recover and thrive. I think it's part of our duty and our common agenda. Education, uh, this is very much UNESCO perspective, is a basic fundamental human right and the strongest driver anchored to shape a sustainable future. I think we all agree in this room uh, about this point. The urgency now of the learning recovery has to be tackled through a much bolder and braver rethinking of education, of its purposes, its contents, and delivery models. In other words, its role as a public common good. And I think we don't have to, to lose this opportunity. Times of crisis call for visions, for sure, for acts of fate, just like those that founded the UN in the aftermath of the Second War. At the several turning points in recent history, uh, UNESCO has spearheaded an exercise to set out a new vision for its domains of competences, including education. Professor Ryman's very much well presented one of these milestones that has been released recently and interestingly has been planned before the COVID-19 pandemic, exactly a few months before the world changed into 20. And uh, I don't have to spend too much time on that as uh, Fernando already explained the sense and the spirit of this uh, report. I just brought some uh, also summaries to, to, for your attention, but the real core key message is calling for a new social contract for education, uh, which is about rebalancing a lot of different system of relationship with each other, with the planet, and with technology, of course. It makes the case for pedagogies that emphasize cooperation and solidarity. So, it's about, of course, using the, the language uh, in a different way. It's not more about competition in education or through education, but it's about cooperation through education and solidarity. And for curricula and prize, ecological, intercultural, 
and interdisciplinary through interdisciplinary learning. In a world that remains deeply interdependent, despite escalating tensions, we more than ever need education to build personal and collective capacities for transformation. I don't think it's an utopia, honestly. It provides a direction to guide what you already mentioned this morning, a human-centered recovery. And it's possible to get it. I think that uh, to have a transformation in, in education and transformation in society through transforming education, uh, there is a, a kind of uh, dynamic process of interaction with the world to put in practice. And uh, I see a few gold standards to make this happen. Let me recall briefly, as time is going run. As the pandemic has demonstrated everywhere, schools are far more than places for learning, spaces for growing together, social interaction, protection, nutrition, essential services. I, I already evoked the academic and psychological toll of closures. The first step is about inclusive recovery to get all kids back to school and learn in safe environments. This is a priority that we share as international community. This is a priority that we want to present at political leadership to focus and to invest about. Every school needs the capacity to assess learning losses and put in place remedial programs whether through target instruction, consolidating the curriculum, or extending instructional time. But a real successful recovery has to go beyond the academic, especially for the most vulnerable children, acting on all the barriers that keep still them out of school or not learning. Comprehensive school health and nutrition programs, including school feeding, are essential. To, to get this uh, achievement. This is why UNESCO is working with some partners on that side, such as UNICEF, the World Food Program, WHO, and uh, there is an interesting initiative now, which we call the School Meals Coalition, which is supposed to provide this approach, comprehensive approach to school organization and uh, policies in the coming, year, in the coming months. Second point, teachers and teaching profession. We didn't talk so much today about teachers. You have to keep in mind that without teachers well-motivated, well-trained in the center of the classroom, nothing happens. And teachers carry tremendous responsibility. They are already at the center stage of this recovery, and they've been our frontline workers like medical, hospital, uh, medical doctors at the hospital during the pandemic. And this brings me to, so we need to, to really to invest, to recognize, to support uh, the social role of teachers and to put in practice policies which are uh, exactly coherent with this vision. And this brings me to the third point, which is about how we steer the digital transformation for inclusion and equity. This is a point which you already mentioned this morning, many speakers. and. Uh, we know that we are not on the right track. Our education tech tragedy studies uh, cautions that the logic and business models steering this transformation, led largely by commercial technology, of course, uh, tend to track education and knowledge as private commodities. But there is the, the duty to, to reverse this vision and to unlock the potential of technology at the service of learners and teachers and communities. This is the, the, the sense of the initiative that we gather together with Dubai Cares, a partner which very much focusing on connectivity. And the result is the Global Declaration on Connectivity for Education that puts forward the three key simple principles. Center innovation on the most marginalized, expanding investing in open, free, and high quality digital content, and supporting pedagogical innovation through technology. And this kind of provides a roadmap to develop in the coming months. Well, which is the challenge now? I think our challenge today is a humanistic 
and ethical. These are the two dimensions which are still a bit missing in the big picture. We have a collective responsibility towards this COVID-19 generation to make education a public good and involve youth in protecting, defending, creating, and co-creating the new model. The United Nations Secretary General, as you may be know, has called for a transforming education summit, which is not to be supposed to stand in a lone event at the end of this year, in September, alongside the General Assembly. But it should be really a kind of a catalyst of a catalyzer of a movement around education. And this will take a surge, we hope, in financing. And uh, I just to recall some numbers, education's share of total public spending has remained stagnant over the past 20 years. But this is something that Jeff already very clearly mentioned and recall all of us. And the funding deficit could hit $200 billion a year. So the small money we are, you know, we are, we are mobilizing are really peanuts uh, in, uh, in comparison to what we need. And this is the urgency to boost education's share in recovery plans, which is not the case, actually. Well, we also learned that education is not a standalone goal. It's a societal endeavor, and it needs all society behind it. Children and youth themselves living in most deprived circumstances, contests, uh, in conflict affected situations like refugees, like migrants, are asking for this human right. And this is their hope and future. I think that this is why, one, the reason why the global compact launched by Pope Francis two years ago carries such meaning to us at UNESCO. And that's why we are so committed to, to give our contribution to that that important mission. Still, I wish to go back to square number one, as I mentioned before, which is about the importance of language, language matters, and it's about building the new narrative now, keeping back those key words that two years ago, a few days before the world changed, were already in our common vocabulary in this room. Solidarity, respect, tolerance, making education the main driver for that. And this is something that His Holiness affirmed at the interreligious dialogue last October at the Vatican when I had the privilege to, to, to be invited to attend. And he also gave to us at UNESCO a, a, a nice message to teachers, valorizing the role of teachers in the process. Quoting from the Pope, all change requires an educational process aimed at developing new solidarity and a more welcoming society. And I think that this is uh, the new grammar and the new vocabulary we need for the coming years. And I think we have a legacy to build on, and that's, I mean, also the sense of this initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. We now turn to one of our colleagues in Mundo Zoom, Sarah Dryden Peterson, the director of the REACH initiative at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Professor Dryden Peterson. Thanks so much, Marcelo and Stefania. Um, I hope you can hear me well, and please feel free to interrupt if you can't as we mix these hybrid worlds together. Um, but I just wanted to begin by saying hello to all. Um, maybe now my camera is on. Let's see. I hope so. Um, and how wonderful it is to share time together today. I wanted to thank you for for inviting me to join this conversation and just delighted to be part of it, both listening um, to the presentations and the discussion itself. I wanted to begin with a question, um, this question here of what it would take to ensure that all young people have access to learning that enables them to feel a sense of belonging and prepares them to help build more peaceful and equitable futures. Um, I see this question following so nicely from your 
thought, Stephanie, and hope we can delve into some of the aspects of it. I work on this question mostly in context of conflict and migration, but I'm going to talk today about its resonance as we think about education in our current pandemic, likely future pandemics, and implications for the COVID-19 generation. Just for some brief context to begin with in terms of conflict and migration so we can see some of the resonance. There are now almost 27 million refugees globally. This number of refugees has grown since World War II and it continues to grow. Um, unfortunately, we expect these numbers to increase further with climate change, political instability, and ongoing conflict globally. Importantly, where refugees live is not distributed equitably globally. So for comparison, in 2017, 25% of the population in Lebanon was a refugee, compared to less than 0.1% in Canada, where I grew up. In 2019, only 1,198 refugees from Afghanistan were admitted to the United States, where I live now, while almost 1.5 million Afghan refugees continue to live in Pakistan, many for more than 20 years. 20 years. This kind of long-term displacement is a central dimension of refugee education, and I think it's deeply relevant as we think about the connections among conflict and pandemic in education. Once displaced, 80% of refugees are displaced for at least five years and 20% for over 20 years, which is almost three times as long as it was in the early 1990s. This length of displacement means that exile is the one and only chance refugee children have for an education. It echoes the thoughts we hear often today of this is the normal that our COVID-19 generation are experiencing. Abrun, one of our research participants in Kenya, thought that he would quickly return to Somalia after he fled with his family. Just like our children thought they would quickly return to school after two weeks, and then we're out of school for almost a year and a half. But 21 years later, Abrun was still in Kenya. This expectation of short-term displacement, short-term disruption, but the reality of long-term displacement and long-term disruption is present for individual refugees, for individual students during the pandemic, and also for agencies making educational policy. As Raphael in Kakuma camp said, we can't keep talking about emergency. If people have been here for 20 years, so when you design things that are emergency in approach and in context, then you're not addressing my needs as I grow up. In my forthcoming book, Right Where We Belong, I expand on the ideas, these essential ideas, that refugees or education in any kind of disruption are not short-term emergency experiences. And also, particularly for refugees and in relation to migration, that it, these, are, these are transnational lives and that these elements of long-term and transnational are essential to understanding educational experiences and the policies and practices that shape them. Across studies, what we have found is that while refugee policies are premised on punctuated migration trajectories, flight now, return when safe, most refugee young people are in processes of continual migration, shaped by shifting migration policies and also by the search for opportunities. Similarly, in pandemic times, most students are experiencing continued, even if exacerbated, inequities. So how can education act on inequities that are exacerbated during times of disruption and uncertainty, the inequities in access, in learning, and in opportunity? When I began my work in refugee education, the dominant global narrative was that it was temporary, a kind of holding pattern until refugees could return to their countries of origin. This was unfortunately the same narrative that dominated early days of educational planning during the COVID pandemic. We see in refugee education, as we have seen around the world during COVID, that short-term and emergency education do not meet the purposes communities have for education during times of disruption. Education is never only about the here and now, as we've heard from so many speakers so far. Our long-term work in many places documents that refugees' experiences of forced displacement and migration and disruption result in a constant navigation of this triangle that I've put on the screen, connecting histories and long-term 
past to the dual imperative to live in the place and the moment where one is hosted, where one is experiencing disruption from the very moment that it happens, this kind of placemaking, while also connecting that placemaking to future building. Future building involves imagining and planning for multiple possible futures, here, there, and or somewhere else entirely. Processes that are not linear and not seeking some sedentary or arrived at geographic, spatial, or social state. There are massive legal, policy, and xenophobic constraints on refugees' access to resources and opportunities for placemaking and for future building. At the same time, refugee young people and their families describe how education can support navigation of these barriers, particularly the misalignments between schooling in the present and opportunities in the future, again, relevant as we think about pandemic education. So how so? I want to situate thinking about this navigation among past, present, and future in a few conceptual ideas. One is negative and positive peace. Johann Galtung, drawing on earlier work of Martin Luther King Jr., describes the differences between negative peace, the absence of direct violence, and positive peace, the absence of structural violence. Positive peace is thus not only the absence of violence, but the presence of conditions that allow individuals to access equal opportunity. Refugee education and pandemic education have been framed often with the goal of negative peace a kind of temporary holding ground to keep people safe until return to school was possible, but without accompanying conditions for learning, for belonging, and for opportunity. Another set of conceptual ideas is what these ideas of peace mean for experiences in schools, for kids and for teachers. Social theorist Nancy Fraser outlines how access to equal opportunities requires redistribution to counter resource-based inequalities and recognition to counter identity-based inequalities. In education, redistribution to address resource-based inequalities can often happen through macro and mesosystem policies. As we see in refugee education, a global policy adopted at national levels to include refugees in national education systems or to widely distribute educational content via radio or standardized digital content during the pandemic. Yet as I see across my work, addressing identity-based inequalities can be much more challenging to institutionalize, especially in settings where refugees or other young people don't have rights, experience more inequalities, and are outside national narratives of belonging, where standardized content does not meet individual needs. What I find, though, is that the possibilities of disrupting these identity-based inequalities are connected to perceptions of futures. From research with refugee students across contexts, we see that they largely reject the notion that they can conceptualize their futures geographically or in a historical moment in terms of nation states or this moment in time. But of course, this is how migration policies are conceptualized. While young people wish for more geographic certainty and more inclusive migration policies are essential, young people also pragmatically think through how little control they have over these kinds of policies. We have learned from them a different way to conceptualize futures and thus purposes and experiences of education in terms of opportunities. This means capacities to apply what one learns, wherever that may be, across place and across time not having to choose between the present and the future, between the kinds of learning that are deemed worthy within the education one experiences in the present and in this specific geography and moment, and the opportunities that one might then trade away for a reimagined future. This framework relies less on education as bounded by geography or a moment in time, and more on education as an enabler of opportunity. I'm going to speak briefly now about one part of our work that addresses these ideas in school setting, for us to try to see what these practices look like in schools and how we might cultivate them, a focus on teachers, as Stephanie had just called for. To do this, I want to draw on a four-year study with Syrian refugees in Lebanon that concludes in this year. This study is a collaborative one 
with Vidur Chopra at Teachers College, Columbia, and colleagues at the American University of Beirut, Carmen Geha and Jumana Talhuk, and Cindy Horst at the Peace Research Institute of Oslo. We've also been working in this project in collaboration with a Syrian artist, Sasso Nurala. These are her drawings that you see on the screen. I'm going to use a few more of her drawings to share findings from one of our case study schools. This is a public second shift school in Lebanon, meaning Lebanese children attend school in the morning and Syrian children in the afternoon in the same school building with many of the same Lebanese teachers, but at different times of the day. One day, two Syrian students arrived to school to find a poster that they had made ripped up and torn to pieces on the floor. The students, Munir and Mira, tried to talk to their teacher about what had happened. By way of explanation, the teacher said that the Lebanese students in the morning shift felt like Munir, Mira, and their friends were intruders on the school. This idea made Munir even more upset, and he said he wanted to rip up all of their work. It seemed only to make it worse when the principal told the class that maybe Lebanese students did this to the poster because, after all, it is their school first. Munir, upset as he was, was also resigned in some ways to this second-class status. As Mira said, that did make some sense. They're Lebanese, and their school is Lebanese. For sure, for sure, for sure, there's no country that favors others over their own citizens, right? In Syria, we also have our own school, and it's not there. Munir explained how this felt to him. It's like they're giving the school to us so we can learn, but not to be established. While he felt this way, he most often found these conversations closed for discussion, with his teacher saying things in response like, don't interfere with politics. We're here to study, not to talk about these issues. With this example from our data in mind, I wanted to come back to this triangle the legal, social, and political positions of refugees within hosting countries creates gaps in the ways that education can support them in connecting histories, placemaking, and future building, further exacerbated during the pandemic. As Munir described, his education involves trade-offs, learning now but with the impossibility of being established. What possibilities are there for positive peace when young people are included within schools while also marginalized from experiences of belonging and opportunity. We find that Syrian students attribute major roles to teachers in developing the kinds of navigational capacities to support connections among past, present, and future, particularly in contexts of uncertainty. Syrian young people describe the structures and content of their schooling as barriers but they connected teacher pedagogies and school relationships to their capacities to connect past, present, and future in ways that do begin to enable belonging and opportunity. The structures of schooling were a constant experience of being behind, having lost time in school because of war, having a hard time catching up with language, and literally coming to school later than behind Lebanese students every day. Compounding this feeling of being behind was the feeling of being intentionally kept separate from Lebanese students in this kind of segregation in morning and afternoon shifts. The structures set up a feeling of being unwanted. On content, overall, refugee students describe how they feel left out of curriculum that does not pertain to them, an experience common not only to refugees, but those marginalized in places in which they are citizens. For example, in a civics lesson on respecting public servants, a Syrian student raised that his father had faced insults when trying to renew the family's residency permits. The student questioned whether such public service warranted respect. The civics teacher smiled sheepishly, and then the bell rang, marking not just the end of the period, but also implicitly communicating that there was little time to bring personal experiences into a formal curriculum that was disconnected from students' lives. Students found that effective teachers supported them to overcome these fixed structures and content of schooling through pedagogical approaches, especially those that enabled them to make sense of the disconnects in their experiences of being included in a national school, but excluded from the curriculum they were learning. 
One student shared how her civics teacher motivated students to become part of society, to have greater importance and not just be on the margin. The teacher reminded the students that with civics, they might be able to change other people's perspectives. Then acknowledging the dissonance between this optimism for students as agents of change and their limited power as refugees and as students, the student recalled how this teacher admitted that in the end, nothing of what's in this lesson exists. We wish it does. But the teacher went on, encouraging students about the future. It's true you're learning things that don't exist, but you might be the reason they exist in the future. You might do things related to politics, and you can change and do the things you studied about. Students connected opportunities for these pedagogies to relationships with teachers, especially ones based in respect, care, trust, support, and open communication. Students described how these kinds of relationships supported them explicitly in reconciling their current placemaking in the fixed geography and the uncertainty of pandemic conditions and their future building, focused on what they hoped would be a less confined opportunity. In important ways, this was about making them feel welcome. As one student said, they, the teachers, didn't at all make us feel that we were entering a country that isn't ours. Students valued relationships in which you feel like someone listening to you. In our data, we see refugee students value teachers who use relationships as the foundation of their pedagogy and support them to navigate the fixed content and structures of schooling by way of this relational pedagogy, even in uncertain times. In new work, we call this relational pedagogy in refugee education pedagogies of belonging. One of my greatest learning experiences over the past two years has been to redesign the course I used to teach on education in armed conflict to one with a broader focus on education in uncertainty, responding to pan pandemic conditions as well, and to design the course around these pedagogies of belonging. It has helped me to learn both how very, very hard this work is as a teacher and also how powerful it is for student learning. Our research finds that young people describe these pedagogies as important to them as they seek to build their futures, unknowable and uncertain as these futures are, with relevance for the continued educational, economic, and political uncertainty so many students continue to face in the context of the COVID pandemic. With my team, we're continuing to explore some of the very same big questions that Stefania outlined about how teachers learn these pedagogies, the institutional and policy conditions that enable them, and the long-term trajectories of students, with implications for all of our millions of students globally who are experiencing uncertainty and disruption and need the kinds of long-term and future-building structures, pedagogies, and relationships that can support them now and into these futures. Thank you, and I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your pithy, on-point um, presentation. Um, we now turn to a very significant and enduring concern, and that is the church and its responses to the pandemic. I, it is a great pleasure uh, to invite that still eminence, Sean Patrick O'Malley, the Archbishop of Boston. Bishop Cardinal O'Malley, are you uh, in Zoom? We're three minutes early. That is a first in academia. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions or reflections on Sarah's presentation? Sarah, you were very economical in your use of time, so thank you for that. Are there any questions or comments for? He's not connected yet. 
Um, okay. We're waiting for uh, Cardinal O'Malley. Are there any questions or? Uh, Carola has a question for, for Sarah. Hello, Sarah. How are you? Uh, I loved your paper, and I love, I really love the concept of pedagogies of belonging. Uh, did you write about this in your book? And if, if not, uh, where can I find the citation? Thanks so much, Carola. Um, I do write about this some in my book, and I have a couple of short papers that I'm happy to um, send and share with you or deliver in person. Um, but I also think that I, I'm hoping in many ways that some of the, what we've heard today and ways in which we're seeing schools and teachers um, create these kinds of pedagogies in many different places that resonate across the world is something that can be a kind of collective mobilization to document these kind of pedagogies and share um, across, across countries, across schools. Um, this is one of the things that, that I for sure notice in my work over time is that teachers are so, um, so hungry to really hear and learn about the kinds of practices that other teachers have created, um, particularly in moments of disruption and crisis when so much um, happens at the very local level. So I look forward to discussing it more with you, Carola, and with anyone else who's interested. Thank you. And I think it's it's very relevant to refugee children. It's also relevant to immigrant children. It's relevant to children in crisis of all kinds, relevant to marginalized children. It's just a concept that is pithy and beautifully, in a little phrase, catching something very important. So thank you for that contribution. Thanks. Any other uh, questions for uh, Sarah? Marcelo, I, I think I see Sebastian with a hand up in Zoom, which may or may not be visible on your screen. Yeah, we can see it. Thank you so much. Okay. Hola, Sebastian, ¿cómo estás? Hola, Marcelo. Please. Hola, ¿qué tal? Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I have a question to, uh, for uh, Stefania. I'm sorry, Sarah. I, I, uh, Stefania, bring in Professor Reimer, Reimer's insights on inclusive leadership. Uh, what, uh, what conservative mindset uh, tendencies or you can identify as potential targets to consider in, in the challenging future steps you described in your Thank you. Still, I think it's about uh, the role of teachers for sure. Inclusive leadership should be one of the main uh, um, approach that teachers have to put in practice in the classroom. This report I was mentioning uh, on the futures of education focused very much on the teaching profession really being rethought around the building, uh, team building and cooperation assets and then the individual improvement of uh, career and training. And the second uh, dimension I see is about uh, the leadership of principals in the schools. I think that this is another important uh, component of uh, a new model of schooling, uh, because uh, if you want really to, to change the, the learn, to reshape learning environments according to these new needs, is very much part of uh, organizing a new kind of uh, uh, space and time for schooling and uh, taking the responsibility to innovate and to, to unlock the potential of innovation. So we saw many, many, many good examples of that at local level. The problem, the challenge is always the same, it, how we can scale up. And this is something that uh, maybe can be part of the, of the collective force we are doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Stefania. Uh, <clears throat> Gabriela, when the Cardinal arrives, can you let me know, please? Thank you. Uh, Jeff, you had a question. I wanted to talk about scaling up just for a moment. Um, I think the way to scale up is to have a plan to scale up and to have a, a budget to scale up. 
And I think that uh, UNESCO and UNICEF together could make a powerful plan, and it would require the Secretary General leading it, uh, and to say this is a goal given what's happened with COVID. And the points you raised are exactly right. Every school should have this, 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 and this. Uh, and that is a very operational thing. Uh, and since you're already doing mapping of schools also and their capacities, the ability to truly operationalize this is there. I had experiences with this uh, a few times, uh, first with the Global Fund, establishing the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria, then with mass distribution of uh, bed nets against malaria and so forth. And uh, it starts out as an idea, but it needs to be turned into something quite specific. And once it's specific, it's a little bit hard to turn down. So if it's specific enough that says, not just a vague goal, but we have identified 18,000 schools across the following countries, and they need this, and per school, this is what is required. And this can be done on the basis of, and then one needs to operationalize it a little bit more deeply, but the, the Minister of Education definitely support local NGO delivery mechanism, competitive bid, something like the, the Global Fund did. And this plan will require $4 billion, say. That's achievable funding. What's not achievable is we'd really like you to help with education to whoever it is. Uh, and I would like to help you with that. It's very specific. If that's what you'd like to do, I think we really should do it. And I've watched several times close up, you know, with the bed nets, I argued seven years, just distribute bed nets because everyone was trying to sell bed nets and everyone was trying to socially market them. And it, it was ridiculous. And we did one test case and then we did a country, Kenya. And then Ban Ki-moon, when he first came into office, I suggested to him, how about making this a centerpiece? Well, WHO is not so sure. The donors aren't so sure. Nobody quite likes this. Is it sustainable? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, and then he said, but I think it's a good idea. And he announced it. And the Global Fund said, oh, of course, we'll support that. And then within three years, it was about a billion nets distributed. So it requires, uh, it requires a specificity, but it's really worth doing. And the points that, the points that you raised, I think make it fun to do in the following sense. Right now, we, we really literally have a way to electrify anything. It's just solar panels on the roof with a battery. It's low cost, but you can, you, you can definitely link it to a school. So the idea is there's connectivity in school and a local Wi-Fi in the school. Then locally, the telecoms and maybe one of the big tech companies yeah will put in the rest of the infrastructure so that it's uh, in so that it's on a base station uh, locally uh, around the schools as well it's very operational now health has done that many times but education has not so immunization campaigns deworming campaigns bed net campaigns hiv drug campaigns this is how they all work Education's never done that because you, before you wouldn't say, well, we're going to build schools by, but here it's something different. It's very, uh, 
specific. Anyway, I won't go on except to say it's absolutely practical. And I hope you don't just put it out as a good idea and as something that at this summit we can endorse, but actually say we're going to do it and this is what we need to do it. And that's a good ass assignment to the Secretary General to go get that. And I know where he can go get that. We're having technical difficulties <laughs> with um, the bishop in in uh, in, in Boston. So um, maybe Stefania, you want to reflect uh, on Jeff's uh, commentary. Uh, then I have a, a question for the for you and yeah. and for Sarah. Are you okay? Shall I go first, or you want? Okay. Yeah, thank you. No, I mean, uh, expected outcomes of this summit, as I, as I try to, to, to briefly summarize, are exactly, Jeff, what you said. Concrete, time-bound, measurable targets within these key priority areas that we actually already identified. I mean, it's not reinventing the wheel. Eh? It's really building on the lessons we learn and also the challenges that we are still facing. Teachers and teaching profession, digital learning from different perspectives we already many times uh, mentioned today. Inclusive healthy schools, which means a lot of what you are, you are suggesting. So, why health as a public sector succeed and education is struggling? Well, listen, that's my, <laughs> at least my understanding. When you are addressing a pandemic, you have a clear mission to achieve. You need vaccines. And then the entire community of researchers institution, uh, health institutions, governments, uh, private sector, you know, big farms as well in this case, put all their energies on something that everybody can understand what it's about, and you can also measure in terms of uh, uh, the budget you need, and you can see clearly which is the benefit you can have. Then there is the question of the discussion on how the science uh, you know, scientists uh, could be better understood and also trusted by common people. This is another part of the challenge. But in terms of vaccination to be prioritized and the whole health sector focusing on that, something that you can easily understand and being accountable for. When you move to education, that's why I insisted very much on the game changer as this crisis has been and still is. Before the pandemic, it was so difficult, Jeff, to, you know, to select within the list of the 10 targets of SDG4, which is about everything. So it's about teachers, it's about early childhood, it's about higher education, it's about uh, education for sustainable development and global citizenship. So it's a long menu and list of priorities. So it's very much difficult to say where do we start from? Where is the the real need and the the urgency we have now? This crisis actually, I can say, oblige all of us to focus on what we need, and that's the result of. Uh, new kind of model of cooperation, and that the, the new common agenda we have. It's not by chance that at UNICEF and UNESCO and the World Bank, different systems, different systems of power or, or you know, of, of, of thinking and, and acting, now we, we speak the same language and we focus on the same priority. So that's why I'm confident that 
we have the opportunity. Of course, it's about fine-tuning the model and to go in New York in September, not simply with these broad, clear priorities, but to say, well, listen, it's about teachers. How many well-trained teachers sub certain region could need in the coming five years in order to fill the gaps that we have and to keep remedial actions to the learning losses in order to, to go beyond the crisis with a new system of teaching. And this is about numbers and, and budget. Sorry. A quick question, Stefano. Why in the education area we do not still have the habit of in applying impact evaluation? Today, we have impact investment, impact finance everywhere. Now, I know that is difficult, but why UNESCO doesn't propose its model of evalu impact evaluation in the education? Of course, then different countries might uh, modify, etc. But unless uh, somebody take the initiatives, because look what happened with the national accounting. National accounting is the system whereby we measure GDP. Now, you know, it was established in the 20s of last century, one century ago. And it came out out of the initiative of three people, in this case, three economists. It was at the time when everybody was saying, oh, it's impossible to measure national income, blah, 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 etc. They started. At the end, everybody got it. And today, of course, today we know that we need to go much beyond. But for a long time, everybody, why don't you do the same? I know that there are difficulties. There is a long list. But because of that, just UNESCO is UNESCO, is United Nations. You have the authority to propose, not to impose, to various countries. And in my opinion, because impact evaluation today is a, a common, nobody is against it. Because uh, output evaluation is not enough. Outcome in evaluation is not enough. We have to move towards impact evaluation. I'm sure that if you do it as UNESCO, you will succeed. Any news? Any good news? We are in, um, moon, we're in Zoom purgatory here. And uh, we are waiting for a signal from uh, the city of Boston. Uh, but per perhaps if um, Melissa just uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Stefania, if the Reverend Barber is ready, uh, he's not ready yet. So Melissa. Uh, if he comes, let me know and I'll stop talking. Um, <laughs> I have a simple, extremely concrete thought about impact evaluations. Having struggled with that in some of our research projects, I can tell you what one of the pro the biggest problem is. Funders don't want to fund what it costs to do a really high quality impact evaluation in a complex situation. Let's educate funders about the long-range benefits of a model program like Stefani is talking about with an incredibly well-designed impact evaluation. I agree it's so important, but I cannot tell you how many people said, oh, the whole study is going to cost blah, 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 price tag. We can't double it by, you know. I, th I think it's the donors, yes. What? <laughs> I, I'm not sure what you said, but I think it was funny. Yeah, oh, good. Good. Agunilia, please. Very quick one on the impact evaluations. I know that uh, UNESCO do do impact evaluations. We do. UNICEF does impact evaluations both in the area of education, but also, and even more so, actually, in social policy. And yes, they are costly. They're very costly. And I think it is an opportunity for us to actually educate 
uh, the, the donors who are funding the development programs by saying we're only actually going to do this if we also make sure that when we do this and implement this program, we also do an impact evaluation. I believe very much in impact evaluations. And on the issue of the uh, Transformation uh, Education Summit, I don't dare to say anything. I will agree we speak with one voice here, the UN, <laughs> UNESCO and UNICEF very much. And my colleagues in, in uh, uh, Jeff, my colleagues in New York, who know the education sector much better than I do, who work very closely with Stefania, and my chief of education research in Florence, uh, who also works very closely together with the teams. They're all aligned. So yes, this is a time to do something real and actually get action. Transformation Summit is going to be transforming things, I hope. Thanks. Uh, I have a question, perhaps for both uh, Stefania and for Sarah uh, in Zoom. And a claim that has been um, articulated is that in education, like in so many other domains, uh, innovation lives in the practice and that teachers um, all over the world work, live in silo. And they have to often invent and reinvent the wheel. Um, if you're a neurotypical um, child, uh, there are ways to teach that are very well established. And it seems that uh, the migration of knowledge from, and practice from one silo to another is very, very complicated in, um, uh, in, in, in the work of teachers. Um, one of the issues you've articulated, I think, with a great deal of clarity and hope and optimism in your voice is the notion that, um, and Fernando also echoed this theme, that the pandemic in, in fundamental ways disrupted these silos and these codified and customary practices that live in separate uh, domains. Um, so I'm intrigued if if um, you can say a little bit more about um, the problem of innovation in, in teaching that lives in the practice, in the practice of uh, teaching. There's an enormous corpus of literature that in the health uh, sciences that flow from medicine on uh, improvement science. Uh, and um, I wonder how much are you thinking about um, ways in which networked improvement can be better articulated? It seems that at the leadership level, uh, Fernando talked about the, the secretary in, in, um, in Sao Paulo, the secretary in Bogota, just bypassing just the traditional structures and going at issues uh, with each other. I wonder how much of that you see. I think that um, the main difference between, between um, teaching in uh, school systems uh, than uh, teaching in university level is very much about this dimension, which is very much local based for teachers, as well as uh, university professors, researchers, are by definition uh, uh, internationally connected and belong to this international community. So what the pandemic actually changed in school system is about this international share information and practices 
exercise that has been established since the beginning of the pandemic, thanks to technology. I mean, that's what I said before. We have to recognize that when we talk about learning continuity and sharing online platforms, UNESCO has been one of the platforms which, since the beginning of the crisis, uh, actually convened all these webinars uh, from the ministerial level to communities and different constituencies, including teachers, in order to make them able to day by day see the evolution of the crisis and what is working, what it doesn't work actually, and how can I take lessons from maybe the other part of the world that I couldn't reach or I didn't think, because Zoom is not something that we discover in the last two years, but we discovered that it's a tool that we can use and we can really take advantage from. That's the, the difference. So I see a new need and demand for international connect, connection and networking between teachers, constituencies, and I think that this is one of the main important assets we have. Um, the role of international organizations is, a, is an important one in the coming months and years because it's about keeping the momentum and not going back to the, to the, to the business as usual or at least encouraging also governments to, 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 to uh, um, support teachers in that. A second point, um, I think it's about what already Fernando mentioned, you know, explained very well. This crisis has been a kind of laboratory for innovation uh, in many sectors, including education. The question, and innovators uh, by definition uh, have been uh, teachers and learners, uh, educators uh, who actually were in, in, the, in, the, in the classroom to reinvent the system uh, overnight almost. So the problem now is how we can uh, um, make this, uh, uh, you know, uh, store of storage of knowledge and good practices available to all those who want to, to take this, uh, this, um, um, you know, to, to build on that. And uh, this is a little bit more complicated because it's about uh, also, uh, that's why I think teach, teaching profession should be the thought. Teachers are not incentivized to, in terms of career development, for sure not in Europe, but I don't think in the, U in the US as well, where there is a career development to, to, to invest their time on that, on that side. So this is maybe something which can be uh, brought out at the level of political leadership and see how uh, teaching profession should be resolved. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shall I go ahead, Marcelo, or has the... Go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Um, sorry, it's hard to read the, the room. Um, but thanks for all these great questions, and um, it, it's, it's great to hear everyone's thoughts. I guess just two things I wanted to mention in response to this collection of questions. And um, Stephanie, I think this the, the first point that I wanted to make really stems out of what you were just saying, too, of kind of where where is the space in which some of this innovation is happening and how do we think about ways in which resources and power reach those spaces and i think one of the things that that has been clear over the pandemic is that it, it is within classrooms and schools that um that innovation and um and shifting practices can happen more quickly um, and in many ways we saw um, teachers and individual schools able to much more um, easily and readily respond to conditions than we did see systems. Um, and I think this is something we see in conflict settings all the time is that we 
um, kind of in, in from a distance, we wait for um, global actors and big solutions um, to come in and act. While in the meantime, families and communities are setting up schools and creating opportunities for kids to learn. Um, and I guess I hope that we can think about the ways in which these resources and power move in multiple directions. And so we're thinking about, just as many have said, kind of what are the practices that teachers are using um, that are particularly effective? And how do we know they're effective? How do we um, learn through all different kinds of research, not just impact evaluations that also struggle with their external validity, um, but multiple methods of trying to figure out great opportunities for different kinds of programs and how they might be adapted in different contexts to really meet different needs um, and share those among these kinds of networks. And I think this really speaks to the kind of middle level leadership, Stefania, that you were talking about before as well, and maybe in response to some of your questions is, uh, in addition, Jeff, um, of thinking about, about the kind of role that regional um, leaders um, within countries play in being able to work with teachers, um, facilitate these kind of professional learning communities, it sounds like, that we're talking about, um, where practices can be shared um, in, in real time. Because I think one of the things that is quite different in education is that these micro-level decisions that teachers are making all the time are so integrally a part of the kind of learning um, that goes on. And those can't be planned in a kind of programmatic way from start to finish. And the second element of that is just the long-term nature. So we're looking at outcomes, but by necessity, we're looking at outcomes that are a very different length. So we may be looking at a program that lasts for three months and what can we know about those outcomes? Great, but we also need to be doing the kind of longitudinal look um, that can really evaluate the kind of outcomes that we're interested in education, which don't only span any particular program or any particular year of school, but which really are a whole generation um, in many ways and, and a whole education for any individual student and for a community. Um, so I'm excited to think about the ways in which these different levels of um, levels of power and level of decision making actually work together to support teachers um, and students within classrooms. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sarah. Um, so I now have a commercial break. And this is, the, this is coming to a theater near you. So unfortunately, uh, the bishop and uh, the reverend have, um, there are issues, uh, confusion about the uh, time differences. So it's not a technology problem, it's a chronometry problem. So what we suggest to do, uh, President Zamani and I, is um, we will, um, if, if there are far, if farther uh, thoughts or, or reflections, we will um, <clears throat> um, stop at seven o'clock and we will have the dinner a little bit earlier and then we will continue the program tomorrow. After we clarify, uh, Greenwich mean time so that we're all on the same uh, time. Uh, Melissa, you, you have a question. I, it, Stefania, uh, uh just ask me if I could go. I don't have slides, but I could go without slides. Okay. We can work it out. Okay. Any any further thoughts or or, or reflections? Okay, this is a very, very small uh, exercise in empathy, in the empathy for our teachers, in the empathy to our um, parents, in the empathy of our students who need to who need to manage these matters on a daily uh, on a daily uh, basis. But Stefania, before we close, um, I, I want to thank you for bringing. Uh, 
to the forefront is the issue of our teachers. And you will recall that in that historic presentation at the Apostolic Palace, Pope Francis made a very, very strong plea for us to support our teachers, for us to admire our teachers, uh, because as you said, without the teachers, uh, there is no uh, education. So thank you so much for, for that intervention. Yes, and if and may I add, um, if we think of caretakers, teachers are one of the caretakers, and uh, with the great re great resignation, we know that nurses and teachers are amongst those ha who have been pushed to their limits with the pandemic. So I think one of the crises of the pandemic is the teachers saying, "This was too much for me. I can't anymore." So finding a way to re respect them, bring them back, re-engage them, and, and make them feel a part of the solution uh, is going to be a very important part of what we need to do in this recovery. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to say that, unlike the rest of us, um, the wonderfully competent and loving folk that feed us, they're ready for us, anytime. So uh, we will serve dinner at, um, in five minutes, so you have a little bit of time to um, uh, stretch your legs, and we will meet downstairs. Uh, and, and thank you uh, again for the very, very wonderful presentation. <laughs>